recess period. Um, can I advise members that in the room, along with myself today, I have Robin Newton, Andy Allen and Alex Eason. And on Starleaf, we have the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Mark Durkin and Sinead Innes. Um, I'll go to the agenda. <coughs> Excuse me, number one. Uh, have we any apologies? No? Sinead, have you anything from either Carol or Fra? Apology from Fra, sir. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Uh, member, it's been, members, it's been brought to my attention that the IFA are still asking for certain fines to be paid by football clubs in the current climate, despite <coughs> the clubs having little or no income um, due to football being suspended at the moment. Can I propose that we write to them on this issue? Members agreement with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, members. Great. Thank you. The, the Minister has been in touch with us regarding arranging her next briefing with the committee. She is concerned about only having a short period of time to brief the committee on a Thursday due to the executive meeting. She has offered a briefing on a Wednesday for an hour and a half. However, this would mean that it would be an informal MS Teams type session as at present where it would be unable to get committee room for Starleaf on a Wednesday. Um, so how would members feel about that or would they prefer to continue with formal sessions on a Thursday morning, which maybe we could start at an earlier time, for example, 8.30 a.m. if possible. If possible, members, any comment they want to make on that? Thursday, early morning. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. I was just going to say, Chair, I think I would prefer that um, when we meet the Minister, the updates are so important for other organisations and people, that, stakeholders that we work with, that we do have it available um, online, you know, for people to be able to um, have witness participation in, even if they can't speak. Um, so I would prefer if we, we moved it to Thursday mornings. Okay. I would be in agreement with you. Kelly, Robin? Sure, I, I, I'm... You'd recall that the officials from the department came to brief us on the Building Inclusive Community Strategy document, um, which uh, I have to say I was surprised. It indeed had no uh, <coughs> measurements, or key objectives or uh, targets uh, within it. Um, now, I, I wrote to the minister uh, after that and I got a reply saying that the minister's Officials would brief the committee on the 20... Well, sometime this month. Uh, yes. 25th, 26th, whatever. 28th, that's the meeting, 28th, I think, isn't it? 28th, yeah. whatever it is. So that's late February. That's 14 months, basically, Chair, since this uh, assembly was reinstated after three years. Uh, I do think, Chair, every other committee, as far as I understand, has the ability to hold the minister to account on the various measurements that are put in place, departmental measurements. And it does seem to me, Chair, that we do need a session with the minister on specifically that document and how uh, she is going to measure the effectiveness of the department, not over the tenure of this, uh, but into uh, 2025. Um, but I think there is an importance there, Chair, that we do need to have a way of holding the Department and the Minister to account. And I don't think it's good enough to have just the officials coming along to brief us on the draft document. OK, and what about your view on holding it on a Wednesday or a Thursday? Well, I have to say, I do, I do, I do not think it's appropriate. I mean, the last meeting we had with the Minister was a very short meeting, which was interfered with by the technology of, of, of the... And that, to be honest, it was a waste of of, of the, the, the allocated time. So I do think, however we do it, sure, we need a briefing from the Minister on that strategy. Okay. okay, I think it, I mean, we are unfortunate, as are any of the Thursday morning committees, because of executive meeting on a Thursday. So that's why we're proposing that we hold it at 8.30 on a Thursday morning. So it, 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 I, I know certainly that would be my opinion, as opposed to a Wednesday, it's the Vice Chair's opinion. Would members then be in agreement that we look at an 8.30 time slot, and then that would, weigh, that would allow the Minister at least a full hour um, to, to brief the committee? Members in agreement with that? Yeah. 
Andy? Sure. Sorry, Sorry, Andy and then Sinead. Sure, no, absolutely. I'm in agreement uh, with what Kelly's outlined. I think it needs to be uh, on the record so people can see what's being advised by the Minister because there are so many important reforms and proposals. And if we look to the one recent example is the wide ranging housing reform that the Minister announced. And I know we tried to do it previously, but um, have an agenda. And I don't often like it, and, and I got told off for it the last time because it's straight outside the boundaries. Um, but as we have the Minister in more frequent, given we have a limited time, but we try to stick to certain topics. So, for example, the reform of the Housing Executive, the inclusion strategy, and um, whatever that may be. But it's going to be that we'll need to meet with the Minister on a very regular basis in respect of these, I think. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Sinead? Thanks, Chair. Um, no, listen, my own opinion is that, you know, when, whenever and however the Minister has offered to meet, I don't really think we're in a position to turn that down, uh, given the fact that this minister, Deidre, has been um, is only just back after a long period of, of illness, and we haven't had a chance to actually catch up with her. Would it not be um, Would it not be a good idea, maybe, to take the the invitation to have the informal meeting with her on Wednesday to thrash out um, any issues that we may have, uh, the likes of which. Uh, Robin has raised there, and that doesn't preclude or uh, exclude um, us from holding uh, an eight thirty meeting on a Thursday as well to drill down into any issues that we that we want to uh, have on the record, as Kelly has suggested. Yeah, no, and I understand that point of view as well, Sinead, and thank you for that. But as a committee, we 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 can request the minister to come in front of us, um, uh, albeit as many times as we like. It's whether or not she takes that up. It's up to us to drive that, not the minister. Um, so, um, members, there's two proposals there. I just need to get what um, other members. Any other members have anything to say on the matter? Mark, if you have anything, Mark, go ahead. I, um, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Just to suppose in terms of what Sinead says, I can see a logic in that. I have to say, now, uh, since we got back here a year ago now, the ministers, be it Minister Hargey or uh, Minister Nikulain, have been actually very good about coming to committee. I'm not always particularly happy about what we get out of it or, or, or even maybe what the minister gets out of it, but I do think they have been good ab about uh, coming. I think in terms of our uh, relationship as a committee with the minister, that's extremely important that we do have a good working relationship. I don't know what sort of message it would send out if we says, no, we don't want to meet you on a Wednesday afternoon at half one. We'll do it formally. We'll, we'll see you on Thursday morning. I think we could do both, uh, and I think there would there would be merit in doing both as well. Okay, thanks for that, Mark. Alex, have you any comment you want to make? I just feel doing it on the Thursday and, and starting earlier is, is the way forward, and you know it's probably recorded and the public can view. Um, the other way, we don't have that, so I would be in favour of just doing the, the earlier morning. Yeah, I suppose the, a way around it then is the way we did our, our, our stakeholder event, where um, the clerks were, were, you know, there were notes taken off the meeting and it was reported back then to the official meeting of decisions that were taken. Um, I mean, I can say I. I'm, I mean, I. It's it's not at my hand. This is it to the, the committee's hand as to what way we want to progress with this. Um, so we need to come to a decision because I'm really quite conscious we have lots and lots and lots of business to get through today. Chair, so, Chair. Um, sorry, sorry. sorry one, one moment, Mark. Um, the clerk wants to say something. Uh, our, our stakeholder meetings have been being held on a Tuesday, which is slightly easier for us to get even room access at this point in time. I wouldn't like to personally guarantee yeah. the room availability on a Wednesday as other committees are meeting on a Wednesday, so I'd have to look into that if, if that is part of the suggested way forward. Okay, and I forgot about that. Um, the, we have an issue of room availability, and we talk about an MS Teams meeting. It will be for, from where everybody is, whether it's their office or their, their home or whatever. Um, so it, just, it means it's just a little bit harder to navigate through that type of a meeting. Um, as opposed to us all being, or well, not all of us, but some of us being in a room and having um, the, the way we have it here with the Starleaf. Look, members, I, I really do need to press on on this. Um, will we then ask the clerks to look at the viability of a room for a Wednesday um, to hold an informal meeting, but um, put down um, to the minister that we would like to have a formal meeting at, at the earliest opportunity on an 8.30, so we can look at both. Um, there's no point, I suppose, ruling out either of them, um, as we don't know room availability and everything else. So, would me are members happy enough that we progress that way? 
Yeah. Yeah, is that okay? Okay, members, then we'll move on then to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. Um, members, you'll find the draft minutes of the 17th of December 2020 on page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Yes? <coughs> Good, thank you. Then I'll move on. Now, this is really quite long, so bear with me. We've got matters arising at agenda item number four. Um, and please, members, feel free to comment on any of this because I find quite a lot of this a bit woolly, some of the responses that we've got from the department. So, first of all, um, can I ask you to go to page 15 where there's a reply from the Minister for Infrastructure to committee queries on community transport. So, I'm going to ask members, are they content to note uh, page 15 or any comment? Page 15, community transport, any comment? Content to note? Sorry. Oh. <coughs> I know, Kelly, you're having to go between both here. <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to find my microphone chair, if I may come in. Yeah. Um, there has been an ongoing issue with that community transport, I'll declare an interest, having been the director for Northern Ireland of Community Transport Association. Uh, one of the issues within the department has been um, that their funding, even though their charities, um, has, has not been... Um, programmed into funding criteria. Um, I think this is something that if the Concordat agreement within the Department of Communities is going forward and they're looking for long-term funding, um, as a follow-up to this one, as an example of charities that are funded outside and in different departments, perhaps we could ask for clarification um, with regards to organisations like Community Transport that their funding is given a program um, and therefore means that it's within a timetabled amount that can be included in budgets. Um, I know there is a remit within that Department of Infrastructure um, to fund rural access, but we're hearing more and more often that um, rural isolation is having an impact and, and from this committee's point of view, lack of access to um, banking options and the closure of rural post offices means that people do need to have access to services and that has particular bearing on access to um, benefits whenever the post office contract finishes. So I think we should be pushing maybe for the officials from our, the communities department to clarify what role they have with other departments where there are charities being funded um, to ensure that the objectives that we're trying to achieve for charities where, where it's multi-year budgets for them um, and some sort of security of budget um, is, is made available. Kelly, uh, Robin. Chair, I, th I think the, the Minister Mallon has made, uh, I think, a very uh, good decision in terms of looking at the long-term viability of the organisations. And I do think that we should be encouraging her activity in meeting with Minister Hargey and Minister Swan, because as, as Kelly Armstrong says, this is a, an issue, and particularly in rural areas, but e even in inner city areas, it's an, uh, 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 an issue around isolation um, uh, for, for many people. <coughs> and indeed, I do think that the, 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 to have one minister, it's only a, an opinion of course, but to have one minister responsible for what can be a multiple problem uh, situation, I think we should encourage the, 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 the work of Minister Mallon with Minister Hargey and Minister Swan to explore the potential of how they can uh, and working together and how they can actually get the thing back on track. Okay, thank you, Robin. Okay, members, happy enough with the um, those comments and um, actions out of this, yeah. Okay, we'll move on then. Okay, members, then can I ask you then to turn to page nineteen of your meeting pack? And there's a response from the Minister of Health in relation to committee queries on HSC service-related contracts and full cost recovery. Um, again, members, any comment or content to note with that? Content? Great. Yep, I need somebody to say something. Yes, content? Yeah. <coughs> okay, then members, um, we've been provided at page 23 and 25 with departmental replies to committee queries on welfare reform mitigations. Um, the Minister highlights a number of points. Officials are developing proposals for how the review of mitigations can be completed and the committee will be given opportunity to consider the format 
of the proposals. The Minister acknowledges the delay in bringing forward the legislation and to minimise further delay plans to bring forward legislation that will both extend and amend welfare mitigation schemes simultaneously by way of two statutory rules. An update will be provided to the committee as soon as is possible and the welfare mitigations funding is ring-fenced and therefore any underspent underspend must be surrendered to the Department for Finance. Um, members, any comments on that, or are they content to note that also? Sinead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Tara, just echo what you said there, and I think it's really um, positive in that response as well, that the Minister has given, given assurances that she'll bring forward legislation to um, to close the loopholes that were, were raised by the committee at the uh, the last time this was before us as well. So um, I think it will be really good to get a better understanding of how that will play out and, and what it will look like. And um, if it's not the minister herself, perhaps uh, officials could um, could come before us and give us a give us an update on on that as well. Okay, thanks, Sinead. I suppose my only concern is that is the length of time that the committee will have. Um, to look at these proposals and scrutinise any of these proposals um, is going to end up, I would imagine, a pretty short period of time. So um, that would be my, my main concern here, Kelly. I was just going to say, I'm actually echoing what you're saying, um, Chair. I do have a concern. I know that there's work happening within the department. I'm very grateful for that. There are certain concerns that members of, of this committee um, have with regards to the mitigation measures and why we would like to see a lot of those um, absolutely continued. For example, the bedroom tax. Um, there are other gaps that we need to discuss um, the, the implications if we were as Northern Ireland to, to do a different route from DWP. Um, I just don't know whether we're going to get enough time to do that. We we have the welfare mitigations coming to an end at the end of March. It's not that far away. Um, I'm, I have a concern that, that the consultation and the scrutiny on that um, isn't going to be enough. If, if officials are able to come to us, um, I prefer that they did that as soon as possible um, because at least then we can work with them as opposed to having to react to something when it's a done deal. Yeah, I agree. And I think we need to, um, on that, right then through to the department and ask for that to be done sooner rather than later. Any other comment on this um, part of the agenda, members? Or can we move on? Okay, we'll move on then. Um, all right, then can I inform members you've been provided at page 27 with a ministerial rep reply to committee queries on the COVID-19 heating payment scheme SL1. The minister states that she has instructed officials to consider the committee's requests on this issue, but notes that in the development of any scheme, there will always be groups that feel that they should be included, which were not. And members, we do have the statutory rule in our packs on this issue. Um, members, any comment, Andy? Yeah, Chair, it'll come as no surprise that I want to make a comment in respect to this. And um, I welcome the fact that the Minister has uh, instructed officials, as, as laid out in the letter, to, to look at this. But I am disappointed that um, the Department have not been more proactive on this. I think it was quite clearly laid out and articulated that um, the criteria of the War Disablement Pension Mobility Supplement um, was directly comparable with that of PIP and DLA at either component. And I, I'm disappointed that uh, there has not been more steps taken in respect of addressing this. Um, I suppose it's important that the layout as well. We're not talking um, thousands and thousands of people. We're talking um, as of March 2020, 654 individuals that would be entitled to this, uh, and it's a very easy fix. Um, and I sort of just want to place on record, having reflected on this uh, COVID heating payment, whilst it's a well-meaning policy, I think it's been very, very poorly drafted and brought together overall. And I think the reflection on the fact that this cohort of people were, were left out of it, and also there is a, a, a wider group of people that would have benefited from this COVID heating payment. And I do understand and appreciate that we have a a limited pot of money in which we're working with, but I believe in, in the end it's a poorly drafted policy and it could have went much further. Thank you, Andy, and I think I would tend to agree with you on that. Any other members want to make comment on this? Um, no, okay. Yeah, 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 um, sorry, Aunt, sorry, Alex, sorry, um, sorry. All right, uh, just agree with Andy and everything. Um, what the Minister says is. Um, Basically, they're going to look at it, but there's no guarantees there. So, no, there's not. I think we need. I don't know if we can chase it up again to to try and force the issue because it's just ridiculous that they're just not automatically included, and they should be. And 
I but don't think yeah. anyone would object to that. No, I do think, um, certainly I would be of the opinion as well, that we do need to make comment back to the Department on this. And as I said, we do have the statutory will in our pack for today, which, I, which we'll get to or we'll talk about when we get to that. But I think we need to register the committee's concern um, that, that not everybody has been included in this. Yeah, and I think, Chair, just to add to that, I think, you know, if, if the Department do not take on board our concerns, and as Alex has pointed out, uh, address this, um, you know, I think the officials, without putting words in their mouth, accepted the, the argument that was being made at the committee meeting before Christmas. It says a lot for our role as a scrutiny committee if the Department do not take on board our advice as a scrutiny MLAs. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and I, I do actually want to pay tribute to you for the amount of work that you have put into this um, since this was announced. So, uh, well done, and I certainly will be happy enough for the committee to take that forward as well. Okay, members, any other comment on that, or can we move on? <coughs> okay, we'll move on then. Members, you've been provided page 28 with a departmental reply to committee queries on PIP award extension letters. Again, can I ask any comment on this, or are we content to note? Any comments, members? No? Okay. We'll move on then. Members, uh, well, sorry, can I ask you content to note? Because I'm not hearing any noise at all. Content to note? Yes? Okay, thank you. Then, members, could you turn to page 30 of your meeting pack? And there's a departmental, departmental reply to committee queries on the time scale for charities' funding spend. Again, can I ask our members content to note, or do they have any comments on that? No. Nope. Can I content to note then? Yes? Yeah, yep. Okay. Then, members, please turn to page 31, where there's a depart departmental reply to the committee queries on the COVID-19 discretionary support fund. Again, can I ask you content to note, or do you have any comments on page 31 of your meeting pack? Content to note? Oh, sorry, Andy, go ahead. Can I just come in quickly? I think we just need to go back to the department again on this, and I do appreciate, um, you know, it was highlighted in a previous meeting about the underspend. I think the department needs to get much more innovative because I don't know about other MLAs, and I would imagine it's the same across the board. I'm repeatedly being contacted by constituents that are finding it near impossible to avail of the various strands of discretionary support, and we're handing money back. Yeah. We're handing money back. Why, why is the department, are we not making sure that this money is utilised to the maximum effect and is supporting people out there on the ground at the worst possible time? There are people out there who are choosing between heating or eating, and, and I know that's true under normal circumstances, but it's been magnified under the, the COVID pandemic. And, and also, just as a secondary point, I don't think the department fully answered the question that I had in relation to the advance payment. I, I think, actually, the, the response, if I can find it here, sidesteps it. I know it's not a default position that people are offered the advance payment. You don't have to take it, but they don't provide a great extent of, of, of detail in relation to the breakdowns of people that are taking the advance payment and those who are actually... Um, instead getting the contingency fund. I would like to see how well the, the contingency fund is being utilised and how well uh, and, and be able to compare how many people are taking the advance payment instead of the contingency fund. So I'd like, I'd like a lot more information in relation to that from the department. Okay, I think we can write back then and ask those questions. I, I do remember that session in here and I know I'd raised issues myself because we were certainly here through my constituency office about the, the hoops people had to jump through mm. the COVID-19 discretionary support fund. Um, uh, I think I've, I've put a question that down for mm. question time next week. So there are, there, 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 it does actually open up more questions um, as well. So we will write for more defen definitive answers. Um, Kelly? Yes, Chair. Um, I appreciate that the department are trying their best, but um, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not happy with the amount of money that's going to be handed back, particularly for this this part of work that, that is there, in particular because of COVID. Um, my concern would be that we're not getting a breakdown. This is discretionary award, or part of this discretionary award. Um, what are the rationale or what are the reasons why people are being turned down? Um, there are a number of people who work who have not yet received um, access to funding for businesses. They have been turned down. Um, and the reason why I can say that is because they're on the phone to my constituency office. I direct them to discretionary support and then they come back and, and say that people are, they've been told no, that they can't get it. Um, if it is a case that people are out with the discretionary support um, allocation because of income levels. Um, that's one thing. But we need to know why people are being turned down. Because it's discretionary, um, we are leaving it to officers to make that decision. Um, I would love to see the published criteria that says exactly 
why and how people can get it and cannot get it um, and make that easier for people. There's too much money going back. I'm sure like the rest of the committee, um, we are receiving phone calls on a regular basis now from parents. Um, the difference is in this lockdown, it's extremely cold and not nice and people can't get outside to do as much with their children. So we're getting calls from people saying that, that families at home now need to heat their houses longer and it's causing um, more costs to family homes. Um, Surely the discretionary support could help with those families that are already very up against it um, to ensure that their children who are at home during a cold spell um, are in warm homes. Um, I just think that we should be pushing for the department, for the ministers of education and communities to come together to look to see if there's something there that can be done so that, you know, and money is carefully spent but it's spent in directions that can help people at a time when they are facing the most difficult situation. Um, and the ongoing closure of businesses is certainly putting pressure on families that work. Yeah, and I suppose on that point to do with um, heating, heating homes and the warmth issue, um, uh, local councils have been given money by the department as well. And I know that's what they're doing at the moment, um, whether it's a, a 50 pound electric card or 40, 49 pound gas card apparently is the highest you can go or 300 litres of oil I know because I know from my own local council um, that that is going on at the minute but then that relies on people actually knowing that this is available um, which is a big issue as well where you have people who um, have, have maybe got reduced income or have recently lost their jobs and do not know the system and do not know the people that are actually the community groups that have been charged with um, handling this, this, these payments. Um, so I think that message needs to go out as well, that there is other help available too. But I think you're quite right, Kelly. Um, I've been the same in my constituency office at Beggar's Belief at times, some of the decisions that are made um, by, by officials whenever people are in sheer desperation. Andy, you wanted sure, to come back just, in? Uh, just further to the point that you're making about yourself, if, can we ask the department, I know it's been administered by councils, but for more information and also for them to promote these um, these much needed uh, resources on their social media channels because again I have had a, a plethora of individuals come to me highlighting they weren't even aware of it and I know from a technical accounting perspective and Kelly has obviously outlined one possible avenue to look at but can we be putting at the department around reprofiling of these funds and I know it might not be possible but I think they need to be looking at other ways to spend this money and it may perhaps be that that additional money be reprofiled and given to councils. Uh, in respect of under the exceptional circumstances in which we're operating. And I think, you know, if we think back, the Finance Minister clearly articulated that at the back at the start of this pandemic. We're not operating under normal circumstances and we need to make sure we're getting the maximum effect for all the money that we've got and it's not going back to central. Paul? Yeah, I think it would be very embarrassing for, for all departments um, come the end of the financial year when we see if there's money being handed back. But especially as this department deals with the most vulnerable within society, it would be pretty bad. Um, Robin, you want to come in? Just very, very quickly, Chair. The, uh, the, the point that Andy makes is a, a very valid one. The councils will be coming back here sometime in the near future, uh, justifying the money that we provide or that the Assembly provides to them in this pandemic situation. I think we are perfectly entitled, Chair, to go direct to Solus. Uh, and I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, and indeed raise the issue with them and how they are intending to promote the availability of, of this, this support. It, it is something which is not particular to any constituency, maybe for the likes of you and I in, in, in the Near East situation or in the Estates, perhaps not more highly, but it runs right across the whole of Northern Ireland. So. I, I, even, I think that's a good point, and even on that point as well, Robin, I know from speaking to some of our own councillors within my own local council um, that the direction on it hasn't been overly clear because people who have received the extra heating payment are not entitled to this heating payment as far as they were able to read it. it. There hasn't been very clear guidance given either to councils on how this should be distributed. So um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to get more information back, both from Solace and the department, most certainly, um, as to uh, how they see this being rolled out and who they're targeting as well. Um, because I don't think we always target the, the people that are, 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 are most in need because they don't know the system. Kelly? I was just going to say, Chair, just to add to that, um, can we maybe just check to see if the same system is being rolled out by all councils? Um, 
there's a resounding silence in, in the area that I serve, which I have four councils come into, um, and I haven't seen one piece of information out um, sharing that for residents. So um, unless I've just missed it, but um, that's all we, that could be the case. But we need to make sure that um, we know what's happening and is it equitable across the whole of Northern Ireland. I think as a, as a committee that has responsibilities for local government, um, that's something that we need to be mindful of. Is this something that's been prioritised by Belfast um, and perhaps the rural areas aren't seeing just as, as fair a, a rollout of that programme? So it'd be interested to see from Solus, um, as Robin has said, um, how that's working across all councils. And I think that is a good point because we have seen that throughout this pandemic, how councils have worked diff in different ways in distributing, whether it was the food parcels or whatever else that the, that has been done. They've all done it quite differently. Um, I certainly know, and it's been Antrim and Newton Abbey Council. I would have, I live in, so I follow on Facebook, on social media and stuff. Some of our councillors, and I know Belfast are doing it as well. So I know that both those councils um, are, are doing that. But I I know that through social media. Um, Andy. Yeah, and just to add to what the Kelly's point, I've seen an advice and I support referral form, which um, asks individuals to uh, denote um, types of support they need, and also I've seen being highlighted. Uh, uh, I think it's the there's a there's another program through uh, it's called the Warm Well and Connected. Um, so I've seen different uh, bits and pieces of information being put out there, but again. Very much, it's not clear, it's not concise, and uh, and if you happen to stumble across it on social media, and that's no criticism of those organisations, it may well be that they're connecting through social services, through community support organisations, but it'd be good if we're able to get that information out there far and wide to make sure as many people that need this support are able to avail of it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we should have learned by now. We know whenever the food boxes and shielding letters and all of that and how that ended up in some areas an absolute debacle um, because people weren't getting shielding letters to three months after food parcels went out. Um, so I think we should have maybe learned, or the department should have learned a lesson from all of that, um, that there needs to be continuity um, on, on any of this. Members, are happy that we move on from that? Or Mark, sorry, you go ahead. I... Uh Sorry, Chair. I suppose it was just to share some of the concerns that members had, had raised there. Obviously, the, the priority now is getting money out uh, to the people that need it. Uh, we need to know what money is going out now <laughs> and w where it's going, because uh, there's going to be a, a, a lot of uh, scrutiny maybe a year down the line about how money has been spent, uh, where it's been going. I, I, I'd very much agree with Andy there in terms of the importance of us knowing what schemes are out there and and where, because there might be a council somewhere up the up the country somewhere doing something completely different, and because someone shares something on social media, it goes everywhere now. So then I have people contacting me saying, "Can we not get this?" Where we might, my council or the council in my area might just have a different scheme that doesn't do exactly the same. In terms of the correspondence, uh, just uh, I know it leads in the COVID discretionary support fund thing. I just still can't really get my head around this. I'm getting more statistics to do comparisons and that. But to me, it's discretionary support fund with a COVID sticker on it because the money was coming uh, for, for nothing for it. I, I, I find it hugely frustrating when Ministers can understand that, that, that they get a line and they'll say, oh, this is a more generous scheme, Do you know, or a more generous self-isolation grant than uh, in other regions because it's not taxable, whereas in other regions they're actually giving people £500 <laughs> and, you know, the threshold's a lot higher uh, so, so people can more people can qualify for it. But I have yet to meet anyone to get £500 from the COVID discretionary support fund or even discretionary support. And in terms of the discretion applied, Kelly was asking what do they do. They're actually asking for, for people they, they itemise what food they have in their cupboards and fridge and things like that. They go out and dip their oil tank and say how, how much that they have. I mean, I know money shouldn't be handed out uh, willy-nilly, but some of the questions are very invasive indeed. And... Uh, the, the, the money is just not going out and well the evidence is there it hasn't gone out and it's vitally important that we do uh, urge the minister to, to reprofile that to use Andy's expression and, and get it to people who need it because we all know there's plenty of them yeah, thank you mark thank you for that
Um, so, members, are we content we move on? We have a few actions there as well from that. Um, I, I told you whenever I'd started this that some of the responses are so woolly um, that it was hard to get um, information out of them. So, yeah, happy enough that we go ahead with those actions on that as well. Yep. Yes. Please speak to both members. <laughs> okay. Um, can I then ask members if they could turn to page 35 of their meeting pack where we've got a departmental reply to committee queries on the charities fund. Um, the department states that during phase one, some charities were ineligible to apply because they had received other financial support. However, in phase two, all 8,819 local charities are eligible to apply for financial support and applications can be submitted electronically between the 6th and 22nd of January. Um, the, the presence of reserves does not make a charity ineligible to apply for funding. However, available free reserves will be taken into account when determining whether need exists and if an award is appropriate. Um, the revised approach will mean that where a charity has free unrestricted reserves, there will, they will be taken into account in any assessment of financial <coughs> need, but only to the extent that at March, 31st of March, the charity will maintain reserve levels consistent with their documented reserves policy. Um, members, have you any comments you'd like to make on this, Robin? Just very quickly, Chair, I'd just ask if the department intend to contact those uh, charities that were unsuccessful previously to let them know that the conditions are now such that they may well be successful if they reapply. Okay, yep, thank you. Members, any other members want to make a comment on this part of the agenda? No, we're happy enough then to move on. Content we move on? Okay. Yeah, I probably should have Sorry. an interest as a charity trustee. Just okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you for that. Okay, members, then can I move on then to page 44 of our meeting pack? Um, where we'll have a deep, where there's a department, departmental reply to committee queries on its five-year strategy. Again, are content mm -hmm. to note our any comment on this page 44 of your meeting pack. No comment. Content to note then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then can I ask you to move on to page 46 of your meeting pack, where there's a, a departmental letter in relation to the review of charity regulations. The reply states that the department plans to develop a draft bill to amend the Charities Act with the aim to introducing primary legislation by Easter 2021. The Minister will also launch an independent review of charity regulation to include the performance of the current regulator. Officials will be happy to brief the committee further on both the review and the proposed bill. Members, after the meeting of the December the 3rd, we sent a request to the Department requesting a written briefing paper on why Section 167 of the Charities Act um, Northern Ireland 2008 has not been enacted. Our request was made back, um, uh, sorry, on request was made on the back, our request is made on the back of our consideration of correspondence from the Chief Executive of the Charity Commission, NI, which provided information on matters raised by CO3 on the length of time some charities were waiting for registration. We do not seem to have had any response on that specific issue. So while we're being told that all of these charities can apply, we know that there are still charities that can't apply um, because this is, yes, is yet to be enacted. Members, um, any comments on, on this or any uh, are content to note? I know that I would be happy that we um, ask officials um, to come in and brief us both on the review of the proposed bill and to chase up the response on the section 167. Members, anything further they want to add to that? Kelly? Um, Chair, sorry, I had I had asked the question specifically. I believe that the the new round of funding, once uh, the one six seven charities can apply to that. Um, a final recognition that those organisations that have a headquarters in you know outside of Northern Ireland. Um, and the work that they do in Northern Ireland is particular to here. It's not as if when somebody applies um, from one of those national charities that the money is being assumed into another part of the UK. Um, but I, I agree. I think that the committee needs to have an opportunity to um, raise the concerns that have been raised with us by, by charities um, about um, the current processes. Um, it would be very useful to get the officials and at some stage, I know we have a very busy program, but in advance of the, the legislation going further, it would be good to have input to that. Okay, 
happy enough with that. Members agreed? Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, members, we're going to, um, I think at this stage, what I'm going to do, I still have quite a lot of stuff on the agenda to get through and matters arising, but I am conscious that we have several um, uh, witness sessions to do with the bill. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause those matters arising now and move then forward if members are in agreement with that. Um, just bear with me. Do I see where I am here on my meeting pack? Yeah. Um, so members, are, if they're in agreement, we'll, we'll put a halt there to matters arising and move then on to our witness sessions because I'm just very conscious of time and what we have to get through. And if we have time, we'll come back to those. And if not, we can bring them up at next week's meeting. Um, before I move on to agenda item five, can I just put down for the record that we've received a, an apology from Carol as well? Okay, members, we're going to then move then straight into agenda item five, which is a briefing from Hospitality Ulster on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. The briefing paper is at page 75 of your meeting pack. Members have also been provided with a raised briefing paper on employment in the hospitality sector at page 108. Um, and this is a supplementary paper to the one that Ray's presented to us back in November. Can I then welcome to our meeting then Colin Neal, the Chief Executive of Hospitality Ulster, Stephen McGorian, Managing Director of the Horatio Group, and Phil Patterson, Managing Director of the Approachable Group. Um, you are all very welcome, and I would assume as yourself, Colin, we don't seem to have you on video, Colin, are you there? Yes, I, I am here, I've turned it on, can you hear me? I can hear you all right, but we just can't see your lovely face, I'm afraid. So <laughs> but if, you, Hi, no, if you want to go ahead, just go on ahead and give us your briefing, Colin. I'll go ahead, Chair, and uh, uh, you can... You can pull up a picture of me if you like. Um, look, again, look, thank you very much, Chair, and to the members for allowing us to uh, give evidence uh, today on this bill. This, this is a really important bill for our industry, uh, has been for years and made even more important by the, the, the current COVID situation. Uh, Chair, can I start off by saying, I know they have given, uh, given a written apology, but Michael Bell from the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association rang me and asked me to give you a, a, a verbal apology. Uh, just COVID issues and Brexit have pulled them away, so they weren't given verbal evidence. Uh, but he wanted to give his apologies and say that uh, he is aligned with our position on the, on the bill. Uh, for those that don't know us, Hospitality Ulster, uh, where our membership organisation, our membership uh, representing pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels, major visitor attractions, and indeed uh, the airport, uh, and our focus is, is food and beverage. Uh, according to the, the department, current department figures, there are 1,236 pubs, 145 hotels, and 555 licensed restaurants in the province, although I think their, their hotels are slightly off. Um, unlike Great Britain the, the, you know, and the Republic of Ireland, the Northern Ireland market in our sector is small. Uh, and when you take it that 25% uh, of the population in Ireland do not drink, it's one of the highest levels, I think, in Europe. Uh, it shows the reduction in, in uh, the marketplace. And that marketplace, the on-trade, if you take our pubs, restaurants, hotels, etc., only sell about 23% of all the alcohol um, sold in the province, with something like 70% actually being consumed at home. Um, the process of modern, modernising this legislation indeed has passed over, I think it's the last count, I think it's six ministers have had this on their desk. And I actually have forgotten the number of times I've presented to committee on this bill. It's been so in the begging. In the written evidence, you know, we, there are obviously the issues that we've answered around the clauses proposed, but we would also like to, ha like to highlight some other uh, elements, the like of the opportunity to facilitate the development and sustainability of our community pubs under the, the pub is the hub model, which is used widely across uh, GB and allows you know, pubs to be the farmer's produce shop in the village. It allows lending libraries and indeed to be like internet or hot, internet hotspots um, when there's trouble with broadband uh, in the areas. There, there's also the issue that the bill doesn't address is that Sunday nights, uh, we close at midnight. So actually, it's Monday mornings. Uh, we cannot have a, a late license on that day. 
and with the growing tourism market and particularly west of the band, Sunday night is a big night and we were keen that uh, these were all aligned uh, accordingly. There, there is a, a complicated issue around Article 44s and 45s. Uh, you know, we'll get into that later, hopefully, Chair, but there's a, an issue about aligning those uh, and allowing them to apply on uh, the premises. And also there's the issue of updating our entertainment because, as you may be aware, uh, a late entertainment, uh, requi our late licence requires either entertainment or substantial food, and a DJ is not technically classed as live entertainment under the current rules. But the urgency of this bill cannot be stressed enough. You know, Pre-COVID, we supported 65,000 jobs, had a two billion pound turnover, you know, accounted for two thirds of tourism spend, and a third of all agri-food produced in Northern as bought by us. But COVID has impacted our industry more than most. And it's 298 days since the Prime Minister actually brought in the first lockdown. In that period, our, our food-led premises have only been open 119 days, and that's been with severe restrictions. And our traditional non-food pubs, I detest the term wet pub chair, um, the non-food pubs have only been open 23 days, and indeed in the Derry City and Strabane area, even less. So I don't think it takes... A genius to work out the difficulty we are in. You know, we estimate from research about 30% of restaurants, 18% of hotels and 11 centre pubs are at risk of never reopening. It is therefore vital that we move this bill as fast as we possibly can and I respect the due process uh, needed and also that the bill does nothing to actually harm the industry as well. Thank you Chair for the introduction uh, and uh, myself and my two colleagues are happy to take questions from the, the, the committee. Thank you, Colin. And uh, it is a bit like deja vu. I think at one stage during the old DSD committee, you were nearly becoming a member of the committee. You were in front of us that many times um, discussing this. Um, so uh, I, I know that you're very much well and truly over your brief. You've been uh, looking at this for, for a long, long time. And, and you commented there um, when in, your, in your presentation about the, uh, the, the length of time that it's going to take for the committee to scrutinise that. And I'm sure you do understand um, why we needed to, to put the extension in place and you know how this is a much wider scope that, of the bill than it was back in 2016 and I, I suppose as, as committee uh, lead I just want to give you the assurance that the committee will um, do due diligence to this but also we'll, we'll do it in the swiftest possible time as well we don't want to hold up things any longer than is necessary so Colin uh, please accept that 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 is certainly the, the view of the committee um, I just then want to then go on to you'd mentioned there about article 44 clauses 1 and 2 and then also about um, article 45 Colin could you go into just a wee bit more detail on that um, are you in general generally agreement with the proposals to extend opening hours in clauses one and two, uh, is that that is that what you're saying there? And then could you go on and talk a wee bit more about clause four, which amends Article 45 for smaller premises that do not offer food or entertainment? Okay, Chair, and uh, uh, the members will see when we start talking articles and stuff, this becomes a complex um, piece of legislation, and it's it's why our our evidence paper is probably so long. We try to ex explain it out. Uh, to set the scene, basically, currently for premises to have a, a, a late night, uh, a late liquor, they have to apply to the in Article 44. That uh, grants them on designated nights the ability currently to sell until 1 a.m. Uh, normal liquor licensing is 1 p or is 11 p.m. Um, under that, um, the sale of alcohol must be ancillary, so it must be live entertainment or a substantial meal taking place. The amendment to increase that um, to allow 104 uh, uh, nights a year that you would actually have that increase to 2 a.m. We are fully supportive and indeed have asked for that for some time. The, the, article 40, the Article 45 is again where someone who does not have an Article 44 uh, usually you find small premises, can go to the police and request currently one of up to 20 
nights a year where they can have a late license to 1 a.m. Uh, and the proposal is uh, to increase that to 85. We again have asked that that should be increased to two a week, weekend nights, because our small bars are really, really struggling. The legislation requiring them to put on entertainment means they have to spend money. So they have to pay someone to sit on a guitar or whatever, maybe to play music to half a dozen people. I myself come from a, a, a rural background. Uh, and during the summer, I mean, the bar late, the local, local village pub, is people coming in from cotton silage and hay and stuff, maybe at 11 o'clock at night coming out in the field for a couple of pints, you know, you know, catch up with the community and indeed addressing loneliness and stuff. And you know, we're putting a barrier there um, to stop small premises doing that. So we would urge the committee to go further than the 85. Uh, the 85 is based around registered clubs who the last time liquor licensing was looked at were raised from 20 to 85. But I would suggest that registered clubs are different. You know, pubs are a commercial operation and they shouldn't be the same. They should be treated as a commercial operation and rather than just having the 85. There also, Chair, if I may take the opportunity, there is an anomaly in the legislation, or sorry, I would term it as an anomaly, as I, as I maybe indicated to, to an introduction. Um, certain areas, um, the like of Fermanagh, in the last time licence are renewed, um, the police were very strict in saying to them, that if you apply for an Article 44, a late licence for every night, we will object to your licence. And indeed, if you get one for every night, we will visit you every night to make sure you're compliant. That has left quite a sizable area there where they have late nights generally, maybe on a Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So if they get a birthday party or a tourism coach coming in on a Monday night, they cannot go late. And indeed, when the police were challenged with this, uh, they said, oh, no, it's OK. They can have their Article 45s for that. It actually, the law doesn't allow you to have both. And we would ask that, that, was, that the law would be amended to allow you to apply for the Article 45 nights if you have an Article 44 due to the restrictions that are being enforced. Okay, Colin, thank you for that. You had mentioned there in your response about um, our more rural pubs. Um, I suppose I, I, I come from an urban area. I represent an urban area, and sometimes it's seen as very different, you know, pubs and clubs, but I know in, in our more rural areas, um, and I just want you to maybe expand a wee bit on your pub as the hub idea. Um, I, I can see the merit in that, but I can also see the criticism that is going to be um, there also about, you know, sort of normalising alcohol consumption, um, especially when it comes to uh, maybe even children having to come in to use the, the likes of the Wi-Fi and things like that as well. So just on that, and I also want to, you know, commend um, the pub industry as well. I know one of our, our local pubs in, in, in the Newton Abbey area of North Belfast, um, who actually are going out of their way every day to phone their regulars because they know that um, for their regulars, the only, only social interaction they have is sitting half the night over one pint in the pub. And, and that's and they're extremely worried. So I suppose I, I want to also put that on the record that I know that there are many landlords out there that are going over and above during COVID times just to ensure that their regulars, their mental health um, is protected and that they do have that that social interaction. So just um, want to make a comment on that, but also the, the pub is the hub. What, what's your ideas around that and what criticisms do you foresee there? Chair, the, the, the pub is a hub model already works across uh, the great, great GB. Uh, indeed, uh, the patron of it is, is Prince Charles. And it is about is recognising that our pubs, you know, our pubs are much more than places where you go for alcohol. Indeed, I would argue very few pubs nowadays, you go for alcohol, you go for social inter interaction, you go for have a pint while you're chatting to your mates, watching sport, having a meal. Uh, or whatever, and and you mean big big element of our pubs are community based. An awful lot of people will sort they see Belfast and they think that's our pub industry. And whilst that's a really good you know part of our pub industry, it is not the majority of our industry. The majority of our industry are town centre or rural pubs who they they're they're actually the, almost like the family hub. It's the social family of many people who live in their own. Many elderly people uh, retired and such, who I mean, that's where they meet and socialise. 
They are also key parts of the community. You know, huge charity events, and as you've highlighted, I know dozens of pubs who are running all sorts of schemes to look after their regulars. And indeed, even when in normal conditions, if 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 an older uh, regular maybe hasn't turned in for a few days, they'll give them a bell to see how they are and if they're ill and if they need anything. And I think you know the the model that we have in our like liquor license legislation restricts the development of that. We've seen it in England where you know we have you know community pubs, rural pubs, you know, be able to provide additional services to their village, to their community, and that could be the farmers' produce. Um, there are examples of a lending library, as I said, the um, Wi-Fi hotspots. And indeed, look, there are many people, uh, as the bill tries to address, about underage um, people being in uh, premises at the moment for family events uh, and sporting events and stuff. There are many pubs now where the church actually use the spare room and stuff to meet in because they don't want it to heat a big church hall or you know, women come together, you know, or sorry, that sounds very sexist. People come together maybe for netting or reading clubs and stuff. And you know, it's important that the flexibility is there to expand it. Uh, and our legislation currently prohibits that. It's a bit of, you remember back to the old days of the spirit grocer that uh, Ireland was famous for. And you went in, and the hub, you know, you, you often found the publican was your local grocery store. He was also the, the undertaker. Uh, and we still have a few are the undertakers, but uh, not all related from the pub anymore, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, this is about sensible, responsible approach. This is not about exposing children to, you know, people and, you know, singing and dancing shoulder to shoulder. That's not the environments that these would apply in. And indeed, you know, this sort of model w wouldn't be something you would see in a busy city centre pub. This is about supporting local communities and actually ensuring that the Wonder Pub is there to serve the community because this would allow them to diversify a bit. But it's really about providing that cohesion for the local community as well. Thank you, Colin. And Colin, I'm very glad you corrected yourself earlier because I do know a few men that can read as well. So that was good that you corrected yourself there. Um, can I then just ask you, uh, uh, I suppose, more the elephant in the room, and that's around tap rooms. And I know in your submission you mentioned that allowing small producers to create tap rooms would directly compete with pubs. And we, as committee, have heard evidence that is contrary to that. Um, so, just if you could maybe go into a bit more detail around your views on tap rooms and also how the members of your industry, um, are they or can they help these independent brewers? I'm very happy to, Chair, uh, say uh, my, my two colleagues indeed uh, will be able to expand on my comments because they both stock craft beers. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say actually the, the whole issue of our craft brewers, distillers, and cideries, uh, important not to miss them, uh, having a licensed category, we have championed for years, long before anybody else had it on the agenda, we have been lobbying for it because we recognize their value and indeed they are an important part of our offer through our bars and also an important part of our tourism offer. And that's why we have always lobbied for them to get a licensed category that allows them, as part of a visitor experience, chargeable to actually give you a free sample, to sell you something manufactured on their premises to take away, and also that they can use that license to actually go to recognized food and beverage events um, and sell online. The only difference we have with the, the um, craft brewers is the tap room, because really what we do there is creating a pub by another name. Uh, it creates an unfair advantage because pubs are rated on their turnover. Pubs will pay an average two and a half times the business rates of if you replace that building with a shop. Some of the, the evidence I have seen so far, um, I would question um, the, the value of a license. You know, to buy a license at 750,000, uh, show me where, uh, the people lining up to sell them. Uh, there is a cost on a license. It, it is about 70000 um, but that drops down uh, out and around the province. Um, there are absolute umpteen opportunities to rent pubs, and indeed about 40% of Belfast pubs are rent 
rent it. So there are, you know, very limited. The barriers to opening a pub, you know, you, you know, is the cost of if you want to buy a pub, it's like buying anything and doing it up, and the license is only a fraction of that. Our, our tap rooms, our craft brewers have used occasional licenses, uh, and we have supported that. Um, we have seen how they operate, and you can evidence says there to the tap rooms. You know, I've heard people say, oh, you know, the barriers, the tied house. That again is factually incorrect. About fifty percent of our industry have agreements uh, with suppliers to buy product. You know, the old tied agreement is long gone, and indeed Steve McGorian would give you much better uh, insight into this. But the, the situation now is it's about, you know, people do deals about volume deals. Um, very few pubs are, are, are you know, most pubs, you know, can have craft beer because it's their choice. You know, each pub, we don't have huge chains here. I think the largest chain is about five pubs. So they can choose who they buy from. And indeed, you know, our market is different. We are a larger market, which means craft, craft beer is generally an ale market. And we're also a draft market where craft beer in Northern Ireland is generally bottled. That is a different market. And yes, we have, they have, there's a slow, lower market share in, G, in Northern Ireland there is in GB. But if, if you look for an example, um, I shouldn't pick on them, but they're a, very, it's a, shall I say, a very large outlet in Cathedral Quarter who does not have any volume agreements with anyone, but does not stock craft beer purely because it's his choice because he doesn't feel it shifts in the volume that's needed to be commercial. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, Phil or Stephen, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just a bit, if I can come in, Chair, on the tight trade side of things. Um, it, this, this has changed a lot. On a previous uh, part of my career, I actually set up the contracts department in Guinness. Uh, this is back in the late 90s, early, sort of late 80s, early 90s. And in those days, we went out to Thai pubs. And the idea was that we would lend the pub money at a preferential interest rate in return for them buying everything from us. Um, now, it sounds bad, but uh, but the reason we did that was because in those days, there was no way that pubs could get money from anywhere else. The banks weren't lending. And if they were lending, the interest rate was excessive. It was into double figures. So the breweries filled the gap. Uh, and, and the reason they did that was to allow the industry to continue to to, to uh, develop. Times have changed, and those days have gone. Um, you know, the banks now are much more uh, uh, accepting of pubs. You know, we, we, we're in a different type of uh, environment. So, if you do have a tie now, and they're very very limited. Um, you know, the big suppliers are two of which there are two in Northern Ireland. Really, are only trying to tie down draft beer. So, there's no tie that I'm aware of on bottled beers. And the reason for that is they don't have a big enough range of bottled beers to be able to satisfy the needs of the public. Mm. So the only thing that they're talking to us about, if they are looking for a tie, is draft beer. One of them, one of the big suppliers, even if they do tie in that way, have to allow you to have draft taps. So are exceptions to their tie. So they're not allowed to tie you 100%. So you can put in uh, draft beer if you want from a local supplier and the other big supplier actually works with a local trade, a local uh, craft trade uh, supplier. So they will actually sell you directly kegs of beer. So for example, I would have a, uh, would be seen to be having a tie, but I've got at least three um, local craft beers and draft on my counter. Um, why do I not stock a lot of draft beers or a lot of uh, craft beers in, my, uh, uh, in terms of bottles? Various reasons. One. I don't have this, the cooling space for them. Two, they tend to be too strong, so I can't really sell them. And three, they're far too expensive. So when I put them, uh, if I do decide to sell some bottled beers, I'm having to sell them, uh, uh, in some cases, dearer than I'm selling a pint, a pint of beer. So commercially, it doesn't make sense. So it's not the tie that is stopping um, the entry for craft beers into the pub industry because we're all allowed to stop them. It just doesn't make commercial sense in many cases to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephen, for that, Phil, have you anything you want to add to that or are you happy enough? Yes, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, just by complete coincidence, I have taken a delivery this morning of local craft beers. Um, that was just a sign for it there. There's, there's Boundary, Alphabet, Kenniger, Lakata, Bullhouse. These are all breweries that are, that are close by to us and on the island of Ireland. Um, we do see this as a collaborative approach, working with craft breweries. 
there really is a shop window for us to sing about the artisans that we have locally. I, I think it's an important part of our mix. My proposition is slightly different than some others. I'm in a, a in Ballyhackamore, which is just outside the city. Um, there's an appetite for craft beer. However, the taproom facility goes against what I believe in, in a public house, in that we should work together, taking footfall from a, from a pub that, that operates seven days a week and has to survive those Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays when it's quiet. Uh, the tap rooms generally trade at the busy times on a Friday and Saturday night. And the journey for the consumer then is restricted if, if they're allowed to run on past a certain time. Um, craft breweries definitely have their place, but I don't believe at the detriment of pubs. Okay, thank you, Phil. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open up for members to, to further question. I have Alex and then I have Kelly. So can anybody then, especially on Starleaf, um, uh, put your hand up button on? Um, Alex, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation and I have to say well done on your briefing paper, it's, it's, it's very good and I was very impressed. Um, just a couple of quick easy questions for you. Um, you want to see Sunday opening from 12 to 1 in the morning. Um, just quickly, would that put us in line with the rest of the UK on that one? And my second question is um, about the increase in hours from 1am to 2 2am. Can you describe to me what benefits you get out of that extra hour opening? If that's possible. Um, Thank you. Well, I remember I'm going to come in and then my, my colleagues can come in uh, to, to support. Um, on, on the, the uh, Sunday issue, which is really a, a Monday morning, actually. It, it's, it's ironic that it's a Sunday rule, but we're open to midnight on Sunday. Uh, look, I mean, there are, uh, my understanding now, GB have no restrictions on through that, and indeed, uh, Republic of Ireland the same. And it is now, as, as tourism develops, Sunday night is, is an important night for people here on holiday, uh, but also particularly west of the band. It has always been traditionally a, a big night, uh, and it's unfair that it, it restricts that uh, element and I say like, it is actually you know this isn't any of our proposals are not about revolution or deregulation indeed they are all very modest I think if you if you total it up it probably works out about an extra two and a quarter hours a week additional per premise which is is next to nothing but it makes a huge difference uh, to footfall we are now seeing consumers come out later they dine later and if if you know, if you don't, if you want to go on from a restaurant to a bar, some entertainment, just to carry on your night, you know, the fact that you know there's only an hour left or something when you finish your meal means you don't bother. Um, so we need it's a modest increase that would make a huge difference to the industry. And I say we have approached this in a sensible way, in a reasoned way, and indeed we have said that we respect that they would have to apply for those. That, that additional sort of extension to 2 a.m. so that if you were in a build-up residential area, you know, residents would have the ability to object. This is not trying to um, just, you know, sort of we have our way and not regard anyone else. Thank you. So you finished, Alex, yeah? Um, yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. I have Kelly and then I have Mark. So, Kelly? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, guys, thank you very much, Colin, as ever. Um, hello, nice to see you. Um, I have a few questions about your paper, and like Alex, thank you very much for the detail that you have provided. It's, it's extremely useful. Can I ask you a few things? I live in a rural area. Um, the extension to um, the 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 length of license. I just want to ask you about this. And this is as much for me as a committee member scrutinizing the legislation um, to, to help me formulate decisions. Um, I would have in my rural area hotels and pubs that are in residential villages, um, towns. Um, I'm just wondering, have you guys any concerns about that additional, you know, the length of the license um, with regards to complaints of noise and people coming out slightly later from those places? Is there anything in that that causes you concern? Um, and how, how would you want us to sort of think about that? I mean, I, and again, look, I'm happy to get my colleagues to come in too, Kelly. And look, thank you for I 
I apologise, the paper probably seemed awfully long, but it is such a complicated area that crosses over, so I did want to, to give you, a, 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 we're steeped in this stuff, as you might understand. Um, look, that's why we, in our proposal, when we, when we talk to the department and we talk to everybody, this is about, it's not about granting everyone an automatic licence to go to 2AM. This is about saying the facilities there, you'd have to apply for it. You know, you'd have to apply to the courts, and there's a process to object. You'd have to go to your council, and there's a process to object. And remember also, too, the councils have total control over the entertainment licence. And you can't do this unless you've got live entertainment or a substantial meal. And when you get to that time of the morning, it's going to be the live entertainment piece. So I think there are quite extensive controls in place. I also don't see every pub in the province wanting to do it. Um, you know, Belfast, you might find that some would want it actually during the week rather than just weekends because they maybe have a, a student market and they're based in commercial areas generally. Others in the city would want it, um, you know, on the Friday and Saturday. And that's actually good because it starts to actually give you variable opening and closing times. Right? And taxis, which is uh, always a big issue us getting away. But when you go out around the province, you'd probably find more rural bars that are used that um, would probably use it at the weekend, which is that more commercial time anyway, so it's not impacting um, residents in the evening. But, say, there would be the safeguards that we ourselves are asking for in place that both the courts that deal with the licence extension and then the councils would have controls to make sure that it wasn't granted anywhere that caused uh, issues for residents. So we don't see any issues um, coming back to bite with regards to planning regulations or, you know, anything that way? We, we don't see that, that that could become an issue in the future? I don't think so. Uh, I, think the, I think the mechanisms are so robust in place that, you know, I mean, councils indeed have have not been afraid to remove entertainment licences and stuff. And indeed, as an industry body, we've actually objected to entertainment licences of our own members, which doesn't always make me the most popular trade body in the world, but we believe we've got to be responsible. That leads me into um, a question about, um, you've said that you, you don't support the alignment of entertainment and liquor licences. Can you just um, flesh that out a wee bit for us, just so that, that we as a committee understand why you're against that? Uh, the clarity in that, we don't support it unless the extensions are given. Um, you know, if we don't get the one hour drinking up time and the, the additional 2am, because it would mean our, our offer would be curtailed at half one now which would, would be uh, it, it would be fatal uh, because the current um, you know, we can sell to 1am as the latest anyone can sell alcohol to and you must have been drunk up uh, by half past one so it would mean you know we'd be half one now where some currently have an entertainment license to two um, so it would be a retro step so we're supportive in the context of gaining the the additional time additional two nights a week and the additional drinking up time. And maybe what, what, if I may take opportunity to just clarify on, on the drinking up period. Again, the current drinking up period is 30 minutes. That's not about the sale of, sale of alcohol. That's you to, 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 to finish it. If you've just bought a pint or whatever at, at five minutes to one, you know, you've got to pour it down your neck in 35 minutes. Um, it also means we're left having to confront customers because the way the legislation stands, if you're in licensed premises after 1.30 a.m. and there are open vessels on the table, we could be prosecuted for allowing you to drink after hours. So our only solution is to push everybody onto the street, which is not great for us and it's not great for the customer. It's not great for the impact of our uh, communities we live in as well, whereas they are, we believe, would allow... The, the consumption of whatever you've got left at a reasonable speed, but also a better window to for taxis and stuff to come and go. Some people will go at a quarter past one, others will still be there too. Uh, it lives in a bit of a flexibility there. And I just checked with you, one of the issues that we'd sort of thought about before is um, working time directive. I know that with Brexit, we're, we're not so tied to European, but I'm just wondering, is there any concerns within your sector? So say, for instance, somebody comes in to work at six, um, if that extension to the, the licences there, they effectively will be working 
much longer, but another period of time onto their hours in that day. Is there any concerns about shift patterns or anything for your staff or the staff across the industry? Uh, maybe in that case, look, I, I'll default actually to the two people who actually run the premises yeah. and they can tell you how they understand it and stuff. I'm just wondering how this, have you thought, is this going to impact and have any negative impact, just things that we need to be aware of for staff? I know 48 hours is the is the the maximum working week at the moment. Um, is that going to cause any issues for you? Um, maybe if I go first. Um, for me, uh, where I see the benefit of the two o'clock, firstly, um, I, I think that the two o'clock uh, extension will benefit uh, those premises which are focused mainly on entertainment. At the present moment in time, nightclubs and things don't work. So for them, I can see a growth in business and, uh, and that's an added advantage. For me and my type of business, I'm, uh, I've got a pub in the centre of Belfast, one in Ballyhackamore, and then a semi-rural one in Dunpatrick. The benefit of the two o'clock to me is everything that Colin has just said. Uh, it allows me to phase the people leaving the premises, particularly in the likes of Dunpatrick where taxis are difficult. It gives me more time to get people home um, and it gives them more time to drink up. So I don't actually see it bringing me a lot of additional business. Um, I just think it'll sort of stagger the leaving period. In terms of the staff then, for us, um, we have already set our hours in such a way that uh, people can you know, only work the 48 hours. And you can do that in various different ways. Sometimes it's, it's a normal eight hour working day, but we have staff who only wanna work four days a week. So they might work four, 10 hours. Um, so it's it's just about adjusting your uh, uh, your shift patterns. You know, some people might be going home at eleven uh, once the restaurant side of the business closes, and other people might be coming in at nine to help with the final bit of the restaurant and then finish the, the closing up. So I don't see there being a difficulty there uh, at all. And in fact, I think the staff would welcome it for the reasons that Colin talked about, i.e., not having to confront customers because that's the most annoying part of your day. When you're telling someone, look, I'm sorry, you can't finish that drink. And you'll see it even with some people's trip advisors, really angry doormen, because the doorman's only doing his job and trying to explain. And that's the sort of issues we have. For me, that's the benefit of the two o'clock. Um, and, and if I can kind of diversify a little bit, Colin also talked about the pub as a hub. Um, and I can see this being a, be a benefit to the, the rural pub because, you know, at times it gives them that opportunity um, to put on a little bit of entertainment at the weekend and hopefully then stop their customers going to Belfast. You'll hear a lot. Uh, I'm not quite sure where you live, Minister, rurally, but like in Dan Patrick, I know there's a lot of young people go to Belfast, uh, which is one of the reasons why we can't get taxis to get our customers home. And they're going to Belfast for the late hours. And that's what they're doing. And that's happened to a lot of rural pubs. And so having the hour give them the commercial uh, viability to say, stay with us, we're putting entertainment on, whatever else. The other thing about the pub is a hub that Colin talked about. The commercial model for many of our rural pubs doesn't work at the minute. You know, so you'll see them that they're not opening on the Monday nights, they're not opening during the day. And eventually, if we don't reimagine the hospitality industry, particularly in rural areas, these rural pubs will go. And that's why this started in GP. You know, you had a lot of villages and hamlets where the pub was the centre and it closed because commercially they couldn't survive. Um, and so they had to find all our ways to make that pub viable, which is why the pub as a hub, I think, is a good idea and something we should look at and something we should look at quickly because if we don't look at it quickly, those pubs will be gone and there'll be something else. So. Well, I, I live down the Arts Peninsula and I probably have been in your pub when I was much younger, Stephen, but um, I, I agree with you. Um, given the, the amount of banks that have pulled out of rural areas and, um, to be honest, the post offices have gone into garages because there isn't other options. Um, I know locally here I have the Saltwater Brig pub um, thriving when it comes to, to food sales, has a really good local market. It is a hub. Um, it's a, a warm family atmosphere. And then I have a wee shop um, um, reacted to COVID um, and have been amazing. But if there was a post office in there that the rural community could go and get its, you know, get money out and do different things, it would make such a change. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I was actually wanting to ask you guys as well, um, in the proposals, um, and Chair, I only have a couple more questions. Um, in the proposals, um, youth, youth people in sports clubs, I would, just wanted to get your, your thoughts on this. Um, I'm a bit concerned that we're limiting youth in sports clubs to the summer periods because um, coming from a rural area and, and a, an area that's very much 
state in its sport in GAA. A lot of the award ceremonies and stuff for young people take place in the winter months. Um, and I was just wondering if you would have any concerns if we were as I'm not going to speak for the committee, but if that legislation was changed to allow youth and sports clubs outside of the summer months, whether it's for a set period of days or whatever, or evenings or whatever, to allow that to happen. Yeah, again, again maybe, you know, Colin talked, or, or one of the questions earlier was about, uh, have we any concerns about children in pubs per se? One of the facts that Colin gave you was that only 23% of the alcohol sold yeah. in Northern Ireland is sold in pubs and restaurants. You know, in other words, it's been sold as takeaway in the home. Uh, you know, when I was a child, and I'm much younger than you, I'm much older than you, Minister. When I was a child, when I visited with my parents, they used to be asked, would you like milk and sugar? When I visit, I'm asked, do you want red or white? So children are seeing alcohol every day. They know it's there. And the message we're sending them is you can see alcohol in your home, but you can't go into a premise where there are controls in place. I, I, I don't get that. I don't understand. You know, So it, it's changed. And, and we have these facilities, particularly in rural areas. You know, Why not use the facilities in, in the winter and give the, give the kids a place to go uh, as long as proper controls are put in place to make sure that they're not abusing alcohol because they're seeing it anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. My final thing, as you can imagine, would be about tap rooms. I have two questions on this. The first one would be the legislation doesn't define what a sample size is. Have you guys any thoughts on what that would be? So if somebody buys a visitor, um, a, you know, a visitor experience in a tap or in a, in a local brewery and they're being offered a sample, there's no definition on what that sample size is. What do you think that it should be? And how would you feel if the tap room had a license where it could sell its own produce um, for consumption, just its own produce for consumption on the premises, as opposed to working like pubs where you can choose your preference um, if it's only that way? What's the thoughts on that? And if I may take the first and then open it to the, my, my two colleagues, the, the sample size in our paper, we have suggested one. It's actually one that is uh, used for supermarkets and stuff already. Um, if that giveaway, it, that's purely uh, because that was there. And we thought, well, there's a, a starting point to say, here's what a sample size is. But look, it, it may be a case of it was a, a distillers, it's a, a, it's a measure or, or whatever. I think that's uh, reasonable. I think it's when it's fill my glass again, then it's no longer a, a sample. Uh, and I think we've always supported that that should be um, the case. Um, they, they're actually, the responsible retail code and old codes are mentioned uh, within this, and I'd be keen to take questions on that as well. Responsible retail code lays down the sample uh, currently for the supermarkets and stuff. And indeed, the responsible retail code that is in place at the minute was actually developed and agreed along with the representatives of the supermarkets, uh, although some may not say that. Um, they had huge input to it. So I think it's about being sensible as we go through this legislation, say you know, what would be a reasonable sample. Uh, when it comes to consumption, um, you know, tap rooms, you know, our, our view is that we would create a, a pub by another name. And whilst they're in industrial areas now, it'd be very easy then to set one up, you know, inner towns, inner city centres. Pubs have incredibly high rates, incredibly high controls on them. Um, and indeed, you know, you, you know the, the craft brewers would actually then be competing against the people they're trying to sell their product to. You know, it's a bit like me coming along saying, Kelly, I sell you this nice big yellow bottle or whatever's in it. Um, but you know what? I'm down the street selling it and I've got full margin on it, but you haven't. So it actually could be counterproductive in that, you know, outlets may decide, well, look, I'm not going to sell that because he's selling it. You know, and I, you know, I'm having to directly compete. Um, I do think there's a place for occasional tap rooms, and they have operated under occasional license, um, partnering with pubs. And I think that's the approach here. I mean, we are the industry who will buy the most of their product, so I think partnering with us to do tap rooms in a controlled manner is a much better way. Uh, and we've seen tap rooms operate, uh, and indeed. Beer festivals and all operate under the occasional license system. The occasional license actually allows for that, um, but it allows you to go to court, make sure the right controls are in place, make sure the children's measures are in place. And what we have seen under those occasional licenses, and again, we're not criticised, but we have seen them selling other products. Because if I was going to do a beer night, 
my better half doesn't drink beer. So we've seen tap rooms say, well, look, we're doing wine and we're doing whatever. And that is grand in the context of the limited number of nights. But we feel that pressure would creep into a tap room here. Um, so we do have a different pub model here. I'll accept there are tap rooms in GB, but it's a totally different marketplace. Uh, so we do have an incredibly small market. I say we're Milton Keynes uh, with 25% of them don't drink there. So only so much can be sold. Uh, we are bring in and the other guys on the, the top rooms if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, you go first, Phil. Thanks, thank you, Steve. Um, good morning, Kelly. Uh, mm -hmm. Just your sample size there, as a consumer as well as being a publican, um, a thimble size measure of, of uh, a craft beer is not going to quench my thirst uh, to get to actually know the product. So I agree with Colin, and it should be a sensible size. Um, no more than half a pint, as a guess, um, for someone to actually enjoy. I guess with wine, you, t you take three sips before you actually get to taste what's, what the body of the wine is. Um, so it's really, it's just a sensible approach uh, to be taken into consideration. Um, with tap rooms, there's actually an opportunity here, listening to what Stephen had said previously. Rural pubs are struggling, and we know where we are at the moment in, in the short term with COVID. There's the tap rooms could take a different view here and actually partner with their, with pubs and bring their product to the pubs and perhaps work in partnership on a longer term basis. If they want to operate a permanent tap room, we'll, we'll do that in collaboration with your local pub. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hung up on the size of the sample. You know, if it's a half pint of beer or a pint of beer, fine. You know, it should be in the measure that the person is used to. Um, and like Phil, I'm a supporter of, of artisan beers and whatever. We, I, I stock them on all of my on all of my premises. Um, but I also pay three quarter or sorry, a quarter of a million pounds in rates a year. Um, so. I'm, I'm happy enough for, for uh, a supplier to give away a sample. I'm happy enough for him to sell his own produce during the hours that he's open producing his produce, but I don't really want to see the loophole being used to open another pub in competition to us. No, thank you very much. Um, I know I've taken up an awful lot of your time, Colin, um, Phil, Stephen. Thank you very much. That was really, really useful. Um, and the, the paper, as I say, very, very appreciated. The longer the paper we can get to read in advance, the better. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass you back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I have uh, only one more person that wants to ask a question, and that is Mark Durkin. Mark? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the fellas for the presentation. I won't have that many questions, or sorry, I, I don't have that many questions left. <laughs> uh, but th th thank you uh, for that. I suppose I'll start maybe where Kelly finished, and that's on uh, the craft beers and, and, and the local breweries, who we have heard from a couple of times, and I know they, they've been lobbying extensively, and I think making a, a very cogent uh argument or arguing that they, their case uh, very well. However, I mean, I have put it to them, and, and this will be on record as well, about the importance of, of working in partnership and, uh, I suppose, complementing rather than competing with uh, our, our existing pubs. Is there any scenario that you can see where you would be supportive or, well, at least could live with the open opening of tap rooms, even, even on a very limited basis? Or... or I, I think, uh, Margaret Bank, again, can lead in that, and my colleagues come in. I mean, that already does exist under the occasional license. I mean, the occasional license is a very simple process to do, um, and we have been successful uh, tap rooms run under that, and that is in partnership. Because I, I go back to the thing of, you know, if you're making a product and selling it to me to retail, and then you're opening on, what are the busy nights that I get an opportunity to pay me overheads? and actually sell that product either at a far better profit that I can have because you've got it at cost or at a reduced price. It, you know, it damages the whole uh, ecosystem of the, you, know, you have suppliers who supply the product to the retail world and we sell it on for that consumption on trade. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, uh, if it's not going to be a big volume area for the tap rooms, because their main thing is to sell to the trade, then the current uh, occasional license system allows them to do that volume without any hassle at all. Okay. Uh, 
Mark, if I, if I take Denver and Dunpatrick, just to give you an example. So in Denver and Dunpatrick, I have three draft ales from Castle Wellen on my counter. Or three draft beers, sorry, one of them's, they're not all ales. Three draft beers, and they come from a brewery in Castle Wellen. If that brewery in Castle Wellen decides that he's going to open a tap room and uh, have entertainment and bring people in to drink and whatever else, I'm taking those taps on my counter because he becomes my opposition. So why should I support him? So at the minute, brilliant relationship, love his beers. It's great. I'm trying to drive tourism as well in the Patrick area. It gives the staff something to talk about. It's interesting. It works. But if he decides he wants to come into my side of the business where I'm paying you know, 30 odd thousand pounds in rates or whatever and Dan Patrick and he's going to open a pub a few miles down the road. I'm not stopping his draft beer. Okay. Uh, Mark? Yeah. Mark, uh, just another view on that. Um, there's the opportunity for, for breweries to sign post their consum- all of our consumers, our hospitality consumers, to their pub to continue their journey after their visitor experience. That's for me is a great way of working in partnership, and we and then we can expand upon that and use the occasional license for collaborative festivals and, and around bank holidays and bigger bigger occasions. So I think working together with the craft breweries, we can signpost the industry and and the Irish pub across the world is famous. We don't want to dilute that any further. Okay, uh, thank you. And sorry, Chair, it was remiss of me not to declare an interest uh, at the start. My family are in the have licensed premises. Uh, that was an interesting answer, or, 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 or three answers. It is good that we get another perspective on this. Like I said, th- th- there has been a, a very strong and good lobby, I have to say, f- f- from the local industry. But but I did caution that committee that it wasn't going to be that straightforward. Uh, and it sounds, sadly, that that is the case. Uh, now, in terms of the, the, pre- the stats he presented there, Colin, and it was around uh, pubs at risk of closing. And we've heard there, Stephen in particular mentioned uh, rural pubs, and there, we've had 102 pubs have closed in the last five years. Has there been any sort of geographical analysis of that to say how many were rural, how many were in small towns or, or villages even that might now be left without a pub uh, or, 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 or of those at risk? Are, are there any in that category? Because we have rightly, and other committee members have spoken of the importance, the social importance of a, a, a pub as a co- community hub, and we really can't afford to be losing that from areas. And, and I just wonder, it's not in the legislation now, but is there any scope for us to do something to, to rural-proof legislation or something, or to protect pubs there? Uh, if you look at the age profile maybe of licensees, could a lot of them be older? And with the surrender principle the way it is, and maybe pubs not being that profitable in those areas, maybe just opening a few evenings a week or something, the temptation is always going to be there. In fact, it might be the only option left to those licensees uh, to sell the license on uh, because no one's going to take the pub on us. It's not a particularly viable or profitable business, but the sale it on the Tesco's or, or Spa or whoever who who put an off license in and you'll lose the pub altogether. Now, again, Mark, if I can take this and happy, obviously, that my, my colleagues come in. The what We have seen a, a, a large reduction in our pub trade. That, that's a given, yes. Um, what we've seen is generally, it, um, if you take, obviously, Belfast um, is a different entity because of tourism, level of tourism growth there. That's where our main tourism growth uh, So we haven't seen the same overall reduction in there. But what we tend to see is it's been a reduction in numbers where a town that had seven now has four, that type of thing. There are very few uh, villages in there that we've lost it all together, but we're, we're, we're on a brink. The, the most important thing we can do is actually create an environment where they can be commercially sustainable. Um, trying to prop them up falsely doesn't work. Um, you know, they, they won't last no matter what we do. It's models like the pub is the hub, allowing them to be that, you know, the, 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 the almost back to the spirit grocer to do the, the farmer's produce, the milk or, or whatever. Increasing numbers would actually increase the demise quicker because you actually, there are a... As I'd said, we have a small market with a limited number of people who drink. And the more venues you would put in place, the further you spread that. 
So actually, in bringing more licenses into the field would actually cause more demise. And the problem is where you'd see those licenses go would actually be to the busy areas like Belfast, because if it's not commercially viable to have a pub in my village, it doesn't matter how many more licenses there are, I'm not going to open a pub in that village. Mm -hmm. So it's about finding how we make the one sustainable. Um, and I think it is about that we need now to realise before we lose them, the incredible social value of our pubs, particularly in urban and rural areas, that, that what they provide is well above, it's not all about drink. Indeed, lots of people, you know, lots of older people will sit in a pub all day long and they'll nurse a pint. You know, it's at room temperature by the time they left because they've sat that long and you'll know probably from your own family's experience, you know, they are also a unique tourism offer that we can I wouldn't know that from my own, to be honest, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I think if, if we, the, the current system has served as well in that we haven't seen, and I, I'll probably get told off from some of my colleagues in England to hear this, but you look at Newcastle upon time, we've got Bar Street, we've all these programmes on TV where CCTV footage shows Thousands of people coming on the street at one time. You know, you, you go to the corner kebab shop at four in the morning, you can get a beer with your kebab. We have managed to keep alcohol as it should be, treated as a commodity, sold responsibly, under licensed by responsible licensees on the own trade. And I think it's important we do everything we can to protect that and make what we have, you know, uh, and, and I know we're, we're talking a lot about pub here. Obviously, we have our restaurant trade, our hotel trade and stuff too that this legislation needs uh, amended for. But I think it's important we do nothing to actually damage what's here and do everything we can to help it grow and sustain it. And I'll maybe, if, if we have time, Chair, pass to my two colleagues on that. Yeah, my, my, my thoughts are our legislation at the moment towards uh, pubs and rural pubs in particular restricts the owner from doing things with his premises. And the thinking should be not to restrict what he can do with his premises, but to, man to maintain that he actually treats the alcohol element of his, of his business in the correct way. Um, so we have to, uh, for rural pubs to survive, rural publicans need to think differently. Uh, they need to think about the tourism market. You know, people are out there looking for a real pub experience. They need to think about the artists who are around them, the Irish dancers, the musicians, uh, the people who bake soda bread. How do we introduce that into the pub and how do we create reasons for people to come? They need to work with a sports club. They need to work with a local artisan producer. You know, the artisan producer will bring people to the area. You know, so it's it's a collaborative thing. If, we're, if we want the rural pub to survive, we have to think about it differently, but we need to take the shackles off and allow the person who owns that one to become creative and find a way to make sure that his business can survive in the future. If we keep him as it is now, no, you can only sell alcohol and you can only do it in these hours and so on and so forth, they will disappear because they're not interesting anymore. Um, and the alcohol that they're selling is much more expensive than you can buy in the supermarket because we've encouraged supermarkets to sell alcohol below cost price for some reason. Um, so it, it, it requires a completely new way of thinking and that, it, it, and that has to come from the top, from your sales ministers, but also from the public and themselves. Um, I would su suggest you to have a look at some stage, there's a pub in Stonyford in Kilkenny. Uh, and it's, 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 Stonyford is 350 people living in. Uh, it's called Malsard's O'Grady's Pub. Um, and this year in COVID, he had over 80 coaches booked to come to visit him, tourist coaches. And all he's doing is putting on experiences. And that's where we've got to go. But it's, again, uh, the, the rural pub has to think differently, but we've got to give them the space within which, through legislation, that they can think differently. Okay, thank you, Stephen. That, that's about it. Uh, Chair, thanks. The only other point I had been going to make was around the fact that just because this legislation is proposing giving uh, extended hours or extending the hours of opening doesn't make it, it's not making pubs do that and it is affording uh, flexibility i think what you, you might find even coming back post covid uh hopefully you, you you might find a lot of bars operating on reduced hours anyway but uh no thank you 
Thank you, Mark, and um, thank you, Stephen, for that as well. Um, it's just a shame we're in these times because the committee, are, um, in normal times, will be doing committee visits, and this would have been a great bill for committee visits. Um, but sadly, we're, we're unable to do that. But thanks for pointing that out to us. Um, I've got Sinead waiting to come in, so can I ask Sinead to come in and ask her questions? Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation and for the, the document that was sent through uh, beforehand as well. Listen, all the, all the, the issues are, are, are more or less covered, so I'm not going um, not going to labour the point. But it's just, and I I don't want to be harping back to the to the tap room issue, but I just want to make sure that we've covered all the the issues and all the concerns that uh, that we have. Um, from the start of this uh, legislation being introduced, you know, one of my own concerns was that. Uh, in relation to tap rooms that you know you would be creating these de facto pubs uh, that are operating on more favorable terms uh, than, than our traditional bars at the minute and um, now as other members have alluded to we've had we've heard uh, very compelling evidence from craft brewers and one of the proposals uh, is that if there was to be tap rooms that they would operate um, at uh, you know more restrictive hours so they would have to close by say 11 o'clock um, and just you know, for my own um, for my own opinion going forward, do you guys see any scenario uh, that would allow uh, a coexistence between yourselves and uh, 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 tap rooms? I probably know the answer to that question already, just based on what, what uh, the evidence that we've given so far. But um, if they were to close by say eleven o'clock, if that was if that was the case. Um, and then, as, as you said as well, there are the, the sign posted to the likes of your bars that are selling the uh, stock in the craft uh, craft beers. Is there any scenario at all that you would see that there's a a, a, a way that you could coexist, or um, is it just you know, look, this is not uh, as Stephen said, look, you know, he would have to remove those taps from his bar uh, because it would just be competition. I think said again about men first, and then let my uh, colleagues come in. The the situation again, eleven o'clock. I mean, it, you know, if it was eleven o'clock, that's most of the evening gone. That's the uh, the time when when people would come along and drink. So it would be directly competing at that. And, and I am aware. I mean, there are places where tap rooms shut at six p.m. Um, but I think it is back to the same situation of look. There is a acceptable partnership model there at the moment that I think is works for both. Uh, the brewer and the, the pub uh, to create another pub and other name. Particularly with COVID, we are, are bringing an industry out of the, the biggest crisis is probably seen in a generation or more because they stayed over even during the wars. Uh, we have you know, people hanging on by their fingernail and the energy of the legislature would undermine it more. It, we, we would actually lose more jobs than, than uh, Create. Can I give you a very practical response? Um, craft beers tend to be stronger than standard beers. If the, if the tap room was open to 11 o'clock and their customers were coming to our bar, I would have briefed the doorman not to let them in because they already have too much to drink and I wouldn't want them. So if they're going to the tap bar, they're going to the tap bar. There is no, there's no way they can come to our bar because it, it will change the dynamic that they've already drunk too much. Sinead, that, that fell here. That's actually what I was going to reiterate. There's just what Stephen has said. Um, we do sometimes have to tend up to, to mop up other people's problems who we don't serve alcohol responsibly. We, you know, the restaurant industry survives on alcohol consumption along with its food. Um, and sometimes people overindulge. In licensed premises such as pubs, we believe we are experts in looking after people's well-being and safety and, and providing a controlled environment with, as Stephen said, uh, door staff on and security to make sure that people are safe both coming in and leaving the premises. So for me, 11 o'clock is, is just an absolute non-starter. Can't hear you, Sinead. Sorry, Chair. Uh, yeah, listen, that, that's very useful because, as I said, we've had uh, a very strong lobby from the the craft uh, brewers, and while you know we're we're obviously supportive of them, but we need to hear uh, what the impact would be from from everyone from all sides. So I think that's you know your contribution is very useful uh, for us going forward in our deliberations. Okay, thank you, Sinead. 
Um, can I just ask one more question before I let you go? And that's around the code of, bra code of practice. Um, we have heard in uh, witness sessions on the bill uh, of some uh, people who are not in favour of, of changing it for a, a departmental approved code of practice. Um, it's just calling your opinion on that. And what would you say to those people? Uh, I'll really um, outline what the existing code, that, uh, industry code uh, that exists, just to give some context here. Well, it's, it's not uh, a code that is you know, part of a new scheme and would have to be applied to be if that uh, recognised code came into place. The current code was developed some years ago. It was developed across industry. Everyone was involved. Uh, holes, the, the suppliers... The, the pubs, the restaurants, the supermarkets, all of their trade bodies. And indeed, the current code that exists um, was heavily amended um, to suit the supermarkets. They then decided that they didn't want to take part. And some of the conversation was, well, we'll only do it when it's compulsory. The model that exists at the moment um, is that it has been a code that was developed by the industry in consultation with the then uh, department um, for social development that has now been replaced, obviously, by the communities department. Um, so it is cross-industry, but the industry then, once, once it was developed and agreed, have no say in, it, in its application. It is overseen by an independent complaints panel. It is actually chaired by the ex-assistant chief constable, Duncan McCausland. And if anybody knows Duncan McCausland, is, you know, he's in nobody's pocket, I can tell you that. Um, Yes, I'd seen comments about the Secretariat. We provide the Secretariat because to ensure it, it needs uh, to be tied to a legal entity. And obviously, if you made a decision against a large supermarket, you could find yourself uh, maybe it being disputed in court. The system works really cleanly. As a Secretariat, all we do is we're a mailbox. We have no input whatsoever um, to it. Well, the only input we have is we advise our members on how to comply. Uh, the current code ha has a, a process where if a complaint comes in, the independent panel review it if they think it qualifies within the responsible retailing code. They talk to the complainant and they also talk to the subject of the complaint and in a lengthy process they will decide if there's a breach. Currently if they do that they put a press release out and they, they write to the police and stuff as well. Indeed um, from what I know now, in the, court, the you, can, you can see it yourself because the code uh, producer report, I think the, the Department of Social Development in our community are probably one of the biggest bodies that register complaints to the panel. Um, so it has been engaged in and seen as reasonable. Why is it through a secretariat like ourselves to keep costs down? Because it is... You know, it's not uh, a legal entity. It's not a statutory body. It gets no money from government. Um, so it, you know, it, it, to create a code and then have all sorts of structures in place, a chief executive, a building, the cost goes through the roof. This is really about trying to ensure that everyone plays, not just by the law, but in the spirit of the law. It's accepting that as licensees, we see that we have a moral responsibility to ensure alcohol is marketed responsibly. Again, it can actually act much quicker. If you brought in promotions legislation, which there actually is primary legislation in place, but this was brought in with the support of the then Minister Nelson McCausland because we were able to demonstrate that this could react much quicker. Indeed, when we've seen an incident, um, Hardwell concert, um, in Belfast, critical incident applied, all the ambulances there. I was summoned to a, a meeting with them, I was reports, and all of the statutory bodies in the department were in the room, and it was, well, what can we do to solve this? The responsible retailing code was the only thing that was actually able to change overnight to address it. The rest of it get bogged down, oh, it's too difficult to do legislation for this, that, and the other. So I believe voluntary codes have an important place the current proposal would give whatever codes are accepted, and I'm not saying that the current code would, would have to apply and go through a process, a statutory footing. And that would mean that licensees, one, would have to be aware of it and operate under it. But when they went to renew their license, if the, the independent panel had upheld complaints against them, 
That would be the material consideration and their application. I think that would be very effective. Um, and I, I am surprised that the, the supermarket representatives see me, uh, you know, uh, hospital officers as secretary as a threat. We have no say in it. We are a mailbox and a legal entity that the insurance can be wrapped around the independent panel. Um, and indeed, the supermarkets were offered uh, a place on the panel as an advisor, uh, but declined uh, with the approach that they would take part when it was a legal requirement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin, for that. I think that, that was good, actually, to get that full explanation, because um, I don't think we, uh, even when it, those that had said they were against it, I don't think we got a full explanation as to why. So it was good to get that from you. Look, I have no further questions, or we have no further questions for you. Can I thank all three of you um, for presenting you. to the committee today? And um, yeah, and I, I, as I say, I give you our word that we will we want to scrutinise this as, uh, to the best of our ability, but we also want to see um, this legislation um, be put through as soon as, as as is possible. So thank you very much, all three of you. Thank you to yourself and the committee for giving us the time. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, members, um, we're happy then we'll move on to agenda item six, which was a briefing from the Public Health Agency on the licensing and registration of crops amendment bill. Unfortunately, this has been cancelled, members, um, due to a, a bereavement. We are planning for this briefing to be rescheduled for a later date, as I do believe it is very important that we consider the views of the public health implications uh, and the proposed changes to the law. I think as a committee, we need to have a balanced um, view of things. We need to get that balance from our witness sessions. So I think the Public Health Agency um, most definitely will uh, will definitely be here for a future meeting. Members, I am just going to propose before we move on to agenda item seven that we, we take a very short break to prepare for that. And uh, so we'll not be very long, only a few moments. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. OK, members, um, we'll move on then to Agenda Item 7, which is a briefing from the Belfast Chamber of Commerce on, a, on the um, licensing of registration of clubs amendment bill. Can I then, uh, members, you'll find this at page 137 of your pack, can I then invite our welcome to the meeting, Simon Hamilton, who is their Chief Executive, and Michael Stewart, the President. You are both very welcome. I'm sorry to keep you waiting there. Um, Simon, um, would you want to go ahead and begin your briefing? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to committee members. Very, uh, very much welcome the opportunity to uh, brief the committee this morning. Thank you for the invitation to do so. Um, for, for those uh, committee members who don't know, Belfast Chamber is a, an organisation representing around 600 uh, businesses of all sizes, of all sectors, and from all parts of, of, our, of our capital city. About a fifth of those members are um, in the hospitality, leisure and tourism sector, and the majority of those would be uh, licensed uh, premises. Uh, we're not a, a trade body um, in the way that hospitality Ulster are, and in fact, uh, we would agree with uh, almost everything that uh, hospitality Ulster said in, in their briefing to the committee. With one notable exception, I, I, I will have words with Stephen McGorian later about his stopping people coming to Belfast comments. That's that's worth a, a, side, a, side, a sidebar conversation with Stephen later. Um, but our, our our interest and and support for reforming our, our licensing laws, uh, as well as I suppose modernising and, and aligning with our, our neighbours, um, is very much focused on the importance of uh, hospitality and the licence trade to the wider city economy. Uh, and, and in two particular areas, one, and, and, and Colin and colleagues mentioned it in, in our briefing, was particularly you know, Belfast status as a, as a driver of, of tourism, a major tourism destination. Um, members will note that in our, our briefing we talk about how uh, Belfast has become a, a must-visit destination. Uh, recognised as such by many notable uh, tourism and travel publications. Um, Belfast is home to, I think, approximately half of, of all of Northern Ireland's hotel beds and accounts for a sizable amount of our out-of-state visitor revenue and, and licensed premises, whether that be hotels or, or pubs or bars or restaurants, uh, are a huge attractor and huge part of, of that, that tourism mix. So responding to that uh, evolving and changing status over the years um, is something that I think needs to be reflected in our, our licensing laws, and then and then secondly is you know the important role that, that hospitality has uh, as part of our wider economic ecosystem in, in Belfast, and uh, you know I, I think that particularly at this moment in time when most licensed premises are, are, are closed um, and they're not open to um, to, to, to trade. Um, we can see how that impacts, along with other closures and restrictions on the city's economy. Um, and what we have learned over the last 10 months is just how reliant one sector is on, on the other. Uh, it's, it's sometimes easy to see how our, our licensed premises are, are reliant on, you know, for example, people working in banks, people working in financial services company and tech companies, um, you know, to come after work for a drink, to, to go out with friends on Friday night, whatever it might be. But it worked the other way uh, as well. Those, those uh, companies who have, in many cases, have made Belfast their home or have started up their businesses in Belfast, they rely on the ability to, to attract and retain talent. And that talent is very much attracted to, uh, it's, it's, it's mobile, it can take its skills anywhere. Uh, and, and what helps retain it here in Belfast and attract it to Belfast is the, that lifestyle that the city has to offer, that city buzz that it that, generated and that energy that is generated in no small measure because of, of our hospitality, leisure and, and tourism sector. It is a sector, as, as others have said, that is, is struggling at this moment in time. A, a survey of our members before Christmas, we find that 46% uh, percent of, of members, and this include a large percentage of, of hospitality businesses, have already made redundancies. 45% uh, anticipated more redundancies in the next six months. Um, and 64%, so nearly two thirds of, of members were somewhat or very concerned about the future of their business. So reforming licensing laws and, and getting those in, in place in, in as quickly a period of time as is possible is also, I think, part of aiding uh, the recovery of the city and the wider region's economy. Um, can I just maybe briefly, Chair, if you're happy to pass on to, to our President, Michael Stewart, who, as well as being President of, of Belfast Chamber, has a, a, a lifetime of experience in the, the licensed trade? Absolutely. Thanks, Simon. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for the opportunity this morning. Um, I, like myself, uh, sorry, I, like Colin, uh, have been through many um, 
uh, conversations around licensing reform. Uh, I'm 35 years, I'm in my 35th year in the hospitality industry. And as a previous board member of Hospitality Ulster, I know the pain that Colin has gone through and he's been championing the cause along with Stephen and Phil uh, and other members of the industry. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe just put a little bit of a, a picture of a brief of what those 35 years have meant. I'm not going to take you through my CV, but the point that I want to, to raise is um, when I came home from London in the height of the Troubles uh, in 1987, uh, we opened a bar on the Lisburn Road called Bob Cratchit's. It was Belfast's first theme bar, and it was the newest thing to hit Belfast, uh, created by Croftons and Diageo. Um, it was a big thing. I was a young 26 year old or a younger 26 year old. And, you know, pubs then were very much different to what they are now. Uh, through those 35 years, I've seen the reform of licensing in 1996. I've seen the smoking ban, uh, smoking legislation come in. I remember crashes being closed at two o'clock or three o'clock on a Sunday and then reopening again at seven o'clock that evening. So I've seen Sunday reform myself. I diversified. I became a trainer. I've trained 400 door staff for SIA. So they are uh, licensed door staff. I've done that. Um, I train staff in bars for what is known as responsible alcohol training. And I've worked with the PSNI on drugs awareness training and vulnerability training. Why do I say all this? The pub and the bar has evolved from what it was in 1987 when Bob Cratchit's opened. Belfast has evolved. We've come through the troubles. We've gone through a meteoric rise in uh, tourism, cruise ships, etc., etc. And I see this opportunity of uh, the, the, the chance to reform licensing as well overdue, but also it's part of the organic growth it's part of the organic growth that uh, Belfast and Northern Ireland uh, deserves. Um, so I welcome the opportunity. Hospitality Ulster are obviously the experts on the detail, uh, but from, from a, a chamber point of view, there is a symbiotic relationship between business, you know, retail business, tech business, and hospitality. Just recently, there was a, a a poll, not a poll, a survey where Zoopla highlighted Belfast as the number one tech city uh, and in the in, uh, UK. And a lot of the reasons they listed there were you know, good infrastructure, city centre, living transport, but also a great, vibrant nightlife, hospitality and um, social scene. So that's just a brief on me as to where my journey has been and the why as the why I see this as being an important uh, organic uh, next stage in the, the growth of hospitality. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Simon. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm glad you came in there, Michael, because whenever Simon was, was speaking, I was, I was thinking about Belfast and um, where I come, we don't even call it Belfast or the city, we call it the town. Um, and I, I was in the town um, just the, the week before Christmas and um, I, I kind of just, I was in getting a few bits and pieces and walking about and I just thought, my goodness, I'm, I'm a, a teenager from, I was a teenager in the 80s and I remember walking around Belfast then, even though I wasn't allowed in at that stage, um, if my mother knew she'd have killed me. But then there was a buzz, even though the, the life of our city was being blown to bits, there was still a buzz about the city centre. Um, so there was, but I just I remember there, that, that Christmas week walking around and thinking, my goodness, the buzz is gone. Um, this is awful. This is just terrible. And then you mentioned Bob Cratchit's. Bob Cratchit's. I remember Bob, Bob Cratchit's well. You were taking me back there to all my yesterdays, Michael. So you are. Um, so I do remember that. And I mean, I certainly after that that week or that day walking around town the, the Christmas week and seeing just what what the town had become and how quiet it was and how the life just seemed to have been drained from it. Um, you know, I find that really, really sad, considering all that we have been through here in Northern Ireland, um, that this this awful pandem pandemic has led to that. And I suppose that leads me on to just the, the whole stuff to do with the, the, the scrutiny of this bill, um, you know, and us putting down the extension. And I know that won't have helped. Um, many of those businesses within the city centre, um, and I know, um, and I just, I, I, I'd said it to Colin, and I want to say it to you as well. You know, we we understand that um, the, the parts of the new regulations within this bill are going to help 
um, the hospitality trade. Absolutely, they are. And um, we know that we want to do this and we want to scrutinise this to the best of our ability because we know this is not just for the recovery from COVID, but this bill is there for many years to come uh, and to build that vibrancy again within, uh, within our many towns and cities across Northern Ireland and that we do have a thriving hospitality industry. So I just want to put that on record. Um, I just want to ask you then, Simon, are us delaying this bill um, and, and asking for the extension, do you feel that um, the, the, the hospitality industry that, that you would be in contact with are understanding of that? Do they understand the reason for that? Um, and do you think that will be a, any great detriment um, to the hospitality industry? Uh, I think there's a, uh, there will be an, underst an understanding, yes, in the sense that, you know, that, that I, I think those who have, um, have followed the, the, the journey of this piece of legislation know that it is a serious piece of legislation. I think your point that you made sure is very relevant in terms of, you know, it has a, it is not just here for uh, the here and now, it will be for a considerable period to come. You know, we, we haven't, as, as, as Michael has alluded in terms of his experience over 35 years, we don't reform the licensing laws that often in Northern Ireland. So it, it does have a, it has a life beyond the next couple of years and, and the crisis that we're going through. You know, there will be an impatience that uh, that many would express that it has taken so long for this piece of legislation to come through, and, through, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and look, I, I think that you know the committee obviously has to do its job in, in ensuring that this legislation is right. I thought the the um, the discussion with Hospitality Ulster was, earlier was very interesting in terms of touching on some points as it's always the case with the legislation that on the face of it, it looks like a sensible reform, but you need to get into it, test it, come slightly different perspectives. So look, I think there is an understanding of that. I think I, I would though stress that, uh, you know, the hope that this is in place for as quickly as possible to help to aid that recovery that, that, that you've, um, you've, you've spoken about, you know, that, that, that buzz and that energy isn't there in Belfast at the moment, and we all know why. Um, it needs to come back. I think it will come back. I think we need to be optimistic, um, and we are optimistic. And um, you know, one of the reasons we're optimistic is that um, Belfast is is such a strong, vibrant city in terms of what it has to offer. It has huge potential, uh, and the one thing that I think sets us apart is that we're incredibly resilient as well. And um, as others have said, you know, we have been through a lot down through the years and we keep bouncing back and we will do so again uh, and this legislation these ref the reforms that are contained within it will help us to do that thanks simon i just want to ask you a question specifically mm -hmm. then around the bill and it's to do with um some of the changes that will extend opening hours or drinking up time and things like that and i suppose you would have first-hand knowledge um about the the impact that might have um, within the city centre, certainly. Um, it, it, so, if you any comment you want to make on on that part of the bill? Yeah, I'm, uh, maybe let Michael talk a little bit more as, in terms of his, his frontline experience in, in this regard and, and how the the changes that are proposed will, will help. And I, I think that again, the, co the comments that Colin made earlier about the, you know the slightly slightly it's not entirely uh, different to some of those um, you know more rural settings. Obviously, a big difference in terms of how Belfast looks and feels, but. Belfast does have different dynamics in terms of huge numbers of, of tourists and then particularly international visitors uh, in normal times who have you know slightly different expectations of when they go out to eat and how long when entertainment um, will be provided uh, and also that big student market which is going to get a, a massive boost uh, in the next hopefully in the next uh, nine months with the uh, opening of the new campus at Ulster University and, and 15,000 staff and students coming into to the city so there are those slightly different elements to the city, which uh, I think the, the changes that are proposed will greatly assist, but Michael can talk in, in, in much better detail about that. Okay, thank you, Simon. And Chair, um, if you're going into the town, you don't go, if, if you're a certain age and you go into the town, you don't go in to do your shopping, you go in to do your messages. But anyway, um, as your mummy would know. But um, yes, as I say, I've been in the Australian industry for 35 years. I've seen, you know, their licenses come in and go. Uh, unfortunately, this has taken so long that some of the licensees who started on this journey are no longer with us. But um, you know, Australia, Ulster, and the trade bodies, and you know, and Belfast Chamber would work would work very closely with other uh, agencies, uh, notably the PSNI. Um, PSNI would have the responsibility, obviously, for uh, 
uh, patrolling late nights and, and making sure that uh, there's no disorder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what I have to say is the hospitality industry, bars and restaurants, pubs are one of the most, if not the most highly regulated uh, uh, businesses in our city and that's been more than amplified through COVID, you know, safe practices, etc. So, you know, I think most people would, would welcome the extension of the hours. And I think also we need to flip this on to other people as well. I think the public in general will welcome the um, the extension of ours because gone are the days where, you know, as I say, going back to the 1987 Bob Cratchit's Botanic uh, Inns. I worked with Stephen McGorion for a period there when, you know, it was all about vertical drinking and, you know, the, you know, to use a phrase, get as much down you as you can. Things have changed, you know, people have changed. They're more widely traveled. They're better at cooking at home. They want to have, it's going to the bar is more experiential. It's the experiential thing about having a meal. People are coming out later. They absolutely are. Unfortunately, more people are now drinking at home than they were back in the day because uh, alcohol is cheaper from supermarkets. And that's why it's highly regulated with professional staff at, uh, in bars. So I think to answer your question, if that's what you asked, um, the, the, we would welcome the additional hours because one, it would help with revenues, but two, it also helps to show that the pub is a safe environment, and I think that would be endorsed by the PSNI in many, many areas across Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for that. Um, I'm going to open up to members. I have Kelly and then I have Robin. So, Kelly, do you want to ask your question? Thank you very much, Chair. I hope I'm, you know, I'm not on mute anymore. That's the, the, the whole thing now. I'm on mute. Um, Guys, thank you very much for your presentation. Simon, can I just say um, you've left Strangford and you're looking younger. Um, there must be something in this, this open politics. Um, and Michael, unfortunately, um, I worked in Russell Court at GCIS Advertising for many years, so I spent, unfortunately, too much time in Bob Cratchit's. But, um, yeah, uh, we'll not go there. Um, I remember um, Spuds being the Lonely Heart Club um, many years ago when I would have been frequenting your premises. But I wanted to ask you actually about that nighttime economy, because one of the things that we will find is people coming out of bars slightly later. And I'm not imagining a huge amount of crowds, but there will be congregations of people at that later time. One of the things that we don't have in Belfast is a vast nighttime economy. Um, and what I mean by that is the transport networks to enable people to move on to other places. Um, if this legislation goes through, there is potential there for growth in the market for TransLink, for metro services. Obviously, taxis are there and, and will be able to provide that. But I'm just wondering, it's when people come out and they've they've had a great night and they maybe do want to go for a chip or something else, is, is there development opportunities there for chamber members um, to expand their businesses later to match that need? Yeah, th th thank you very much for your your um, your, your comments. I, yeah, I, I certainly um, I certainly ca can recommend the move, but not not to all of you all at the one time. <laughs> we do need we do need some people that govern the country, particularly at this time. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think as a as a chamber, we're we're incredibly interested in you know the broader regeneration, redevelopment of the city, and you know I think some of the weaknesses in what Belfast has to offer, and in spite of the, you know, the huge strides forward that the city has made and the massive potential that we still have, there, there are you know, weaknesses in the city that have been exposed particularly over the last 10 months. And, and you know, it, you know, we have seen that kind of you know, exacerbated that fact that sometimes, you know, particularly during the week, um, you get about five or six o'clock, the city you know, doesn't really have that buzz and that energy that you would expect to have in a, in a modern cosmopolitan city. And, you know, I think that we can deliver that. I mentioned the university campus, that's something that will help in that regard. Uh, we have a big policy focus on, and it's relevant to the committee's work around the, the need to increase residential living uh, across all tenure types in the, the city center. And that's something that if you compare us to our competitor cities who, who are in the hunt for that same talent and that same investment, they're much better equipped than we are. Um, but also just to get that sense of just broadly and, and residential part, it's a 24-7 a, a city. And, um, you know, you do need those. And that, that does require lots of, let's call it essential infrastructure. Uh, our public transport has taken a, a huge hit over the last period. Um, 
but it needs to come back and it will come back um, because it's a hugely important part of our city's infrastructure. Um, But I do think that, you know, there are opportunities, you're right, apps, and this is why I think, not trying to overstate it because I think the chair's comments are right, you know, that this is a bill for, you know, a decade and more in terms of before it might be looked at again. Um, But I think many of our members who are in those other sectors or other parts of elements of hospitality will seize the opportunities that this presents to to help their businesses and that will certainly help aid recovery uh, and the bounce back that we all hope for michael uh, you know there might be you know your experience again of of, of how businesses can be you know the, the lights and tree can simulate other businesses as well yeah absolutely and uh, just very quickly kelly and chair uh, i always use bob cratchit's it's my get it it's it's my get out of jail free card because there are very few people that don't know it either themselves or their parents, whatever, and particularly a, a superintendent in the PSNI who personally holds me responsible for the fact that he got married to a girl that he met in Bob Cratchit's. But there you go, that's another day's conversation. Um, it is inevitable that with a nighttime economy that opportunities will come. Uh, again, going back over my years, uh, I know that um, TransLink tried on many occasions late night buses, for etc., which... Uh, either failed or you know had issues with security guys and stuff on it uh, and then there's other opportunities around late night food operations etc but i think what this is is this is about growing and, and developing and communicating you know there is a confusion out there amongst the general public as to what time bars and restaurants open and close at and that equally then means issues around uh, transport but i think this will has to, this won't be licensing on its own. This will be a joined up approach, uh, especially for Belfast uh, Chamber and City Centre. One of our main uh, members would be TransLink. Norman Main sits on the board. And, you know, that's a, and, and uh, Christopher McCausen from Value Cap. So there's a network there that, that absolutely uh, will benefit. And I used the word earlier, uh, a term that I found out in biology class, which symbiotic. You know, there is a symbiotic relationship. Um, some people say that when the tide rises, all the boats float. That's not always true for everyone. But this needs to be looked at, worked, and and, and the opportunity um, given. You know, when you think about 104 nights, weekends, you know, an extra hour, if that were, you know, times two, it's not a lot of hours that we're talking about uh, uh in, in reality, but it can make a lot of difference for a lot of people, in, in, in specifically in Belfast and the wider, you know, Northern Ireland. So, um, uh, just just a, just a sort of an anecdotal one again, going back to 1990, uh, I, I would have nipped over to Glasgow quite often when it had the European City of Culture status, and uh, they they were granted 24 hour licenses, which. Um, some people took and some people didn't. But the interesting thing is, uh, uh, I, I read a, a report on, from Strathclyde Police uh, a bit afterwards, and they were very clear in saying that staggering the hours where people were allowed to come out at different times reduced the crime rates in Glasgow city centre by something like 30, 40, 50%. And um, so there, all of this has to be taken into uh, consideration, and I'm sure it will. But I think more than anything it's a positive thing and it will be um there's other stuff i'm maybe if i get a chance later to talk about about travel from the republic of Ireland, especially around easter opening hours etc but uh, I'll, I'll stop at that and take any more questions i was just, my my other question um i brought it up with um colin and the guys at, at hospitality ulster but i'm thinking about um planning permission now it's less of an issue within belfast city center because it's it's less residential than other parts but if we are developing belfast in the future with that new type of urban living where you have like ground level retail and then the upper levels would be more uh, uh, residential i'm just wondering those later later hours the later opening hours while it gives great opportunities do you do you think that there could be any negative sides to those later hours if we are trying to develop Belfast more with that residential offer? I, I, I think look, I, I, I completely understand and get the, get the point, and and um, uh, I think we all know that there are times when licenses or extensions of licenses can create rubbing points, you know, between uh, settled existing residential populations and, and the premises. And, and obviously there is a process to, to work all of that through. And that's why, as, as, as others have said in their evidence, you know, it is a highly regulated sector. There are processes that people have to go through. There are 
systems that folk can use to object, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think all of that needs to remain there and, and remain robust. In terms of the slight difference with, and, and, and notwithstanding all of that, and that, 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 that would have to remain there if, if Belfast was able to hit the kind of targets that the council and its Belfast agenda have set of sort of growing the city centre population by around uh, 30,000 by 2035, very ambitious target that it is. You know, I think that the, the, perhaps a slight difference is that you are, you are, it's it's almost the other way around, you know. So in a lot of those cases that we're talking about, it's a licensed premises coming into an area or doing something in an area that is settled. This is kind of the reverse. And many of the people who would be wanting to live in those um, higher rise uh, apartment blocks or um, whether that's for buying or, or renting are actually almost buying on the basis of what is on ground floor level, you know. So they're expecting... Uh, you know, and they're hoping almost that, you know, there'd be a pub or a, a cafe or a bar um, at ground level. And that's why they're buying it. They're buying into a lifestyle every bit as much as they are buying their the, the apartment or flat that they're purchasing. So I think it's a slightly different uh, context in the city than it might be elsewhere. Obviously, appreciate those rubbing points. And that's why I think there needs to be a robust system there. Michael? I just jump in for 30 seconds, Kelly. Uh, Again, if I ever went on mastermind, my chosen specialist subject would be residence objections to entertainment licensing, etc. from 1987 to 2020. Um, you said you worked in Russell Court. Will you be very aware that there was housing development above Russell Court? I went through four years of trying to, as the manager, uh, to get a license, entertainment license into what was known as the Russell Nightclub. We eventually got it. And in, in, in another world, I was a director in the Hudson Bar in Smithfield where we had residents, etc. So I won't go into the detail on that. But the issue I would bring up is this about partnership and communication. You know, if there are issues, which inevitably, some people raise issues for the sake of raising it. Others raise it because it's a very valid point. And with Russell Court, it was. I physically went into people's apartments and listened to the vibrations of our nightclub, you know, coming up through. So it was a, a fair point, and we had to take steps to sort that out. So the point I'm saying here is, this is why this process has taken probably an extended time. So everybody can be listened to. It's about partnership, it's about communication, and it's about results and resolutions. I think I was reading the, the Belfast um, agenda for this meeting and um, I was amazed when they said, because they always assume that Dublin's a very young city, but Belfast itself is a very young city. You know, the average age of, of people, you know, 21 years of age in, in Belfast is incredible. So I think there's a huge opportunity. I noticed that there's there's not a lot of disagreement with yourselves with the proposals in the legislation. Um, the tap room, you know, and where we will have further discussions as a committee on that. Um, I just was very interested in that planning issue because as we develop more um it's it's going to be something that the council um, will have to take the decisions on residential versus business which we don't want to happen because i think simon you're right um people will want to live in a place where they don't have to have a car and there is good access and all of the the items that they want are on their doorstep and i think this will give it i'm i'm sorry i don't think that we're going to make it in time for easter this year but given the pandemic and the rollout of the vaccine um Perhaps that's that's not a bad. Well, it's, it is a terrible thing having the pandemic, but um, it may not hit so hard this year. But no, thank you very much for that. I'll right. hand you back to the chair now. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank Michael and, and Simon for coming to to the committee. But uh, Michael actually has answered uh, my query. It was around clause two and the uh, further additional hours in his uh, comments to uh, Kelly uh, around the relationships between the pubs uh, and residents. So I'm content, Chair. Okay. All right, Robin. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark Durkin. Mark? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Simon and, and Michael uh, for the presentation there. I have to congratulate Michael on having the best bookshelf I've seen in all these, all these uh, interactive meetings. Here. It's more of a booze. Not, too, not too many books, Mark, as you can see. A booze. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let me just give you a quick anecdote on that, Mark. Um, the, the reason for it is the very reason that you've just said. I get fed up with all these politicians, yourself included, with all these books behind them. And as Michelle O'Neill said on one occasion, the difference is, Michael, those bottles get open, whereas those books in the background don't get open. But there you go. Anyway, these are collector's items. They're not for drinking. 
Sorry. Okay, okay. No, well, mine isn't that impressive. You can't do that <laughs> well there. Okay, uh, so my question's for Simon, uh, and it's good to see you, Simon. I hope you're keeping well. Obviously, you're here representing commerce and, and, and industries that welcome this bill, uh, by, by and large. But given your own ministerial experience and your experiences in MLA, you will be conscious of the need for us to balance this against public health. Now, we were due to have evidence session from the public health agency uh, this morning, and, and, and we haven't managed to do so. But how would you address the concerns that, that they do have and have expressed about increasing opportunities for alcohol consumption and the consequential health impacts on individuals and society as a whole? Look, I think, and again, I think I actually... Michael, with his experience, will have, have some good things to say on, on, on this front too. I think every one of us understands that um, you know, alcohol is a, a regulated substance for very good reason. And um, you know, the, the license premise is a way in which its consumption can be, can be regulated. Uh, I think it was perhaps it was Colin earlier who, who from Hospital Valley Ulster mentioned that you know, the vast majority of the consumption of alcohol uh, and probably you know obviously given circumstances over the last 10 months um, that percentage has massively increased in terms of consumption at in houses and homes yeah. and that's very much unregulated um, and, and you know this isn't so much about you know whilst you know I think a, a very good very cogent argument can be put forward about how this helps uh, the sector to survive and stabilize and then thrive in the longer term a lot of a lot of what is proposed here particularly around additional hours and drinking up time is also about as, as steve mcgorian said earlier about just the good management of a license premises uh, as well so I, I i don't think that um given the way that the trends have have changed and i, I think um you know we're dealing with the acceleration of a lot of a lot of trends as a result of of the pandemic you know, I, I think that yes, you know that that number of you know the percentage of the consumption in a home or a private environment will go down as, as pubs and, and licensed premises open up again. But you know, will that be completely reversed over time? No, it won't. And um, will this legislation have that impact? No, I don't think so. This is about, I think, you know, modernising, bringing this in line with where our neighbours are. I think it also helps to stabilise an industry which has had a really really difficult. Uh, year, perhaps a year and a half before the end of all of this is over. Um, it has been going through a lot of challenges over the, the previous decade or more. Um, I think it gives the industry a chance to stabilize, as others have said, and, and to grow. Um, I don't think um, it is going to lead, because of those changes in behavior and habits and all of those trends, I don't think that this is likely to re- lead to a massive cons- additional consumption of alcohol in licensed premises. I think that if, if people are worried about about that, then I think it is more in that kind of private setting that we need to be worried about. And, and we've seen throughout this pandemic how private settings have been difficult to manage, difficult to control in other regards. So, you know, I think that's where if one sees the dangers of alcohol, uh, I think it's in, 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 in the overconsumption of alcohol. I think it's it should be more in that environment that we should be worried about it than in licensed premises. And uh, Michael may maybe you know from his experience may be able to sort of elaborate, elaborate a little bit further on that, but but I think that's that would be broadly our view, my view personally, obviously, Mark, but also our view as an organisation. No, it would probably be my view personally as as well, Simon, but but just want want to hear that and have it, have it on the record. Yeah, and if I could maybe just interject, uh, not going over what Simon has already said and and uh, Colin, there's been a massive increase in uh, home drinking, you know especially during COVID uh, and over the years from the supermarkets uh, when which alcohol has become more freely available at, at cheaper pricing. I think Colin earlier said something like 23%, I think, of the alcohol consumed is in licensed premises. As I said, I, I, I deliver responsible alcohol training courses to the trade, to the on-trade and the off-trade. And it's not cliched, you know, it is a very regulated uh, business with strict enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one thing that has to be brought up here, and it's the R word. It's not the R rate. It's the R word. It's about responsibility. There's a responsibility on the licensee to to, to dispense alcohol in a safe environment, but there's also a responsibility on the consumer to consume alcohol uh, to their to the, the their, their best ability, whatever, uh, to make sure that they get home safe, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a responsibility. So 
and there's a choice. If extra hours are given, then people don't necessarily have to avail of those extra hours, as in the customer or the uh, the licensed venue. But it's been about having it's about having choice. And when I've been weaned out on many occasions at Easter to talk about the restricted hours over Easter, that's what I always talk about: responsibility and choice. Because you do have a choice to go in to drink, or you have a choice not to go in and drink. Okay, thanks, Amanda, Michael. That's me, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have no other members who have indicated that they want to ask any questions. Um, so can I just then finish by saying thank you, Simon, and thank you, Michael. Um, it was good to go down memory lane there a, a bit with you, Michael, the all those good times. And it was certainly it was great to see you again, Simon, and I have to say you are looking thank awfully you. well. There you are. So, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very bye. much. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item 8 on our meeting pack, which is a briefing from the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. You'll find um, uh, this in page 132 of your meeting pack. And can I welcome to the meeting then Janice Galt, who is the Chief Executive. Janice, can I ask you then to go ahead and brief the committee? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, we uh, represent the hotel sector and the larger accommodation sector and from our point of view we really welcome the changes to the Liquor Licensing Act. Um, hotels have a very unique position in relation to the relationship that they form with people and we have over the last number of years felt that the inability for formals to be staged in any meaningful way in the hotel industry has been a real challenge for us. We think that that's a very important part of this. The other part for us is really the tourism element of this. Very keen to see this jurisdiction operate in a similar way to other locations and for us to be able to make a better offering, particularly around holiday periods and for special events when people maybe would come here for festivals where alcohol may not necessarily be the main impetus of those events, but it certainly would be part of the overall offering. Um, we've seen in recent times things like the, uh, the British Open, um, there was difficulties around that and we would like to see those eradicated. Uh, we also would like to uh, draw attention to the role that tourism has to play in the future of the economy and particularly when we're looking at new products and the opening up of food and drink offerings, a very popular type of tourism at the moment and that the distilleries in areas like that will be able to offer their products in situ in a controlled and regulated manner. We think that controlled and regulated regulation is the way to go and we think that that's very important. There are certain elements of this including the Code of Practice, which in principle we don't have any objection to, but we feel it's very important that there is a strong legislative framework that is easy to enforce, that people do understand the responsibility they have, and that is the responsibility not only of the licensee, but also of those involved in consumption. Um, the hotel sector contributes about £650 million to the local economy in normal years. Regrettably, over the last year, that has been significantly reduced but we would like to see in the coming year that we would have an opportunity to grow that business to ensure that we are not incapacitated in any way. And we think that these changes are something that we very much look forward to working with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice, um, for coming in and briefing us today. I just have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, the, the biggest concern in relation to the definition of a major event and that, the criteria that would be needed um, do you want to go into a little bit more um, explanation on that? It's really the amount, number one, what the definition actually is. Is a major event something of international standing? Um, is, if it's a new event, it's very difficult to ascertain what that would actually be. So therefore, is it something that attracts a certain amount of economic impact? Is it the amount of delegates it has? Is it the actual type of event that it is? And it's also the lag that might be involved before, before something would get um, this major event status. It's how that's actually going to be worked through. When you go out and you bid for events, for example, like the World Police and Fire Games, the British Open and things like that, we would have concerns that this maybe would be seen as a barrier, but it would be much easier if the actual criterion was set out. Um, if there was a criterion and people didn't meet it, then they could look at ways to address that. 
or alternatively we could find different ways of doing things. But I think that it is an area of concern that it would be something that would be seen as a barrier. Grand. Thanks, Janice, for clearing that up. Um, just an, another issue, then, I just want to ask you about um, is your opposition to changes in relation to the advertisement for functions in private members' club? Again, can I ask you if you could expand on that and your reasons for it? We have had experience from members' clubs, and I think the clubs have a very important role to play in the community. But we've had examples where people have advertised, for example, wedding fairs, have gone out and said, you can use our premises for wedding fairs. You can become an associate member for £10, £20, £25, whatever it is. Um, and that for us presents a considerable issue. We pay rates. We have a really a fixed cost base, which is quite considerable. And some of the elements of that we can't compete on because clubs don't pay in that particular manner. If a club is a club, that's fine. And if they want to hold events for their members and their members wish to bring guests again, we don't have any particular issue of that, but we see that this may extend clubs into being simply another venue within a particular community, which will compete against us in an unfair manner. Okay, no, I'm glad you actually went into a bit of detail there, because when I originally thought, thought about it, I thought it was that just the, the 70th birthday party or the, you know, the, the 50th wedding anniversary party, but it, it's actually more than that. It, it's bigger events. Yeah. I mean, we have seen examples where commercial events that people have gone, got a quotation from a hotel or another licensed premises and then have come back and said, well, you were actually much more expensive than X, Y and Z. And it has been gone. It has gone to a club and it has been based in the club. And the way around membership has been, there's been ways around that. Um, so from our point of view, that's where our objection actually lies. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, I'm going to open up to members. I have Kelly has her hand up to speak. Kelly, do you want to come in? Hello, Janice. Thank you very much. Um, I, I probably declare a bit of an interest because I have a, a daughter who would once this COVID lockdown stops, would be delighted to have a school formal and um, would be looking forward to going to a hotel and enjoying the premises. Um, that I actually wanted to ask you about that. Um, Bringing the formals back would be very welcome. And I think across Northern Ireland, there'd be an awful lot of people going, that's reasonable. Why would why was it stopped in the first place? However, in the licensing, it does require that no alcohol would be, be, be made available to those young people. Um, would this incur additional costs to your members to put processes in place that close off the bars? Because obviously those young people, when they're there, they'll be looking to buy soft drinks. Um, so there will be the ability to sell that. But... The alcohol would be closed up. How is there any cost that's going to hit your members? I don't think that there's a cost as such. I mean, prior to the formals being removed, most places would have operated, operated on a soft drinks policy. So you simply either close your bar and offer a sort of a side table which has soft drinks on it, or alternatively, you serve soft drinks from your bar area. We did have a code of practice in place before this where we had certain things, you know, where you... Um, there was a little bit of maybe extra cost occasionally in security where you had to check to ensure that um, people weren't bringing alcohol in. But in general, uh, we had a sort of a bit of a sort of a system going there. We also ensured that a parent, a guardian or a school teacher was involved in the formal. So from our point of view, we really realised the importance of getting people and young people in particular into of their first event, you know, where they are, what they're doing, how they're doing it. And they form a relationship. At that stage, they form a relationship with the hotel. Many people go for family occasions, be they weddings, civil partnerships. That's when they form that relationship with the hotel. And we think that that's very important. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. Um, for someone that goes back to a hotel where I had my wedding reception, and that was not yesterday, um, I, I certainly, we know that. I suppose another, just another point on that hotel. Is we feel that the current situation in relation to formals is that pe young people are going early for a formal. They're getting out of the premises by half past nine and they are actually going to unregulated environments. And it's much easier to place a hundred or place 150 young people in one venue than it is for them to break out into groups of 10. We also think that in reality, people are going out earlier and that it's not really the true experience that we wish people to have. We've also seen that in border areas, there's been what's called a border bleed, where people have gone from Derry, Londonderry into Letterkenny or Bunkrana, um, Newry, they've gone into Dundalk. So I think that that's one element of this that we find 
you know, a particular concern that this is actually business that we've effectively lost for a number of premises um, in the country. This is a big income stream for them over the winter months, you know, maybe five, 10, 15 schools. They really specialise in it and we're very keen to see it restored in a normal circumstance. No, I have to say I agree with you completely. The amount of young people that I know that are arranging transport to, whether it's parties or whether it's another place that they can hire out, um, is concerning because we do want to protect those young people. They are, you know, they may well, some of them may well be 18, but quite a lot of them aren't. And um, we want to protect them from misuse of alcohol elsewhere. And you're right, hotels can provide that protection. Uh, but I want to ask you about um, a of your members will be in areas across Northern Ireland that are residential and I've asked others about this. Have you any concerns where um, maybe a hotel has um, obviously had planning permission and, and has its licences in place but when we go to the later licences that they may have difficulties with those licences given the residential nature of the area that they're situated in? Uh, um, I'm just wondering if any of the members have any concerns about that. Is there anything that we as a committee need to consider with regards to those planning, you know, any criteria or anything that we should be aware of? I think people are acutely aware of their neighbours and the area around them and have no desire to um, cause any difficulties. Most people police this quite easily and we feel that maybe with the longer hours that people will leave in a more orderly manner, that they may not all stay to the end. They may trickle out over a period of time and we see that as a good thing. We also, in terms of our current entertainment licence, have to look at decibels and levels of noise and I think that that's quite an important feature. I think hoteliers in general are part of a community and are quite respectful of that. So we don't envisage there being any particular issue with that measure. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, I know that um, in my local area, there's there's a hotel, to be honest, it has struggled with COVID, dear love them, but they have been amazing, you know, as part of that whole COVID cycle. They've been such a, an integral part of community, providing food and, and things like that. Amazing people. Um, I'm hoping that there's a lot that you have agreed with within the legislation. Is there anything that you want to bring to our attention that that does impact negatively on your, your members? We think, you know, apart from the points that we have raised, I mean, we think that most of it is pretty straightforward. The only concern we would have is the code of practice. Will that cause confusion? Um, and it's more the confusion part of it as to the actual process itself. I don't think anybody wants to be seen as irresponsible, but it's an important thing that we understand that you know, there is legislation here. We would be um, very keen to see the legislation supported with a very strong communication message and particularly maybe a short form of it available. I'm a great believer in the one page communication, um, you know, that people know exactly what's expected of them. Sometimes, and this is not a general comment, but sometimes people can kind of feel that a code of practice maybe gets them away from it and there can be a different interpretation on it. I think when you're introducing new legislation, it has to be very clear what the actual differences are, and that's very important for our membership. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. I'll hand you back to the chair now, but I appreciate absolutely your written document you've given us and your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. I have Robin and then I have Mark. So, Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I really just have one small uh, area. Um, but could, could I just say to, to Janice, um, the hoteliers uh, have played a major, major part in the development of tourism in Northern Ireland over this past number of years and the millions of pounds that have been invested uh, by the sector in the industry has really lifted uh, Northern Ireland's offering in the tourism field. Um, and indeed, in addition to that, the number of uh, jobs and careers that have been uh, created through it. But I think uh, in general, uh, Northern Ireland owes a, a debt of gratitude to those who have been forward thinking and visionary in, in their investment uh, uh, in the infrastructure of Northern Ireland to allow other sections of the, of the uh, economy to, to, to grow. So I think we, well done to, to all of the, your entrepreneurs and business people and corporations that have done that. In, in saying that, uh, and the scale of your, your, your sector, uh, I just had one on you had partially um, 
uh, answered a question, I think, to the chair. And that's on the area of the private members' clubs and premises. Uh, and you gave one small example, I think, the wedding venue uh, exhibition. Um, could you maybe just elaborate on really what your maybe a bit more in detail about what your concerns are about private members, clubs' premises being uh, uh, allowed to open up as a function and event space. My understanding of them is that they're not grand premises, the vast majority of them, uh, and really are attractive maybe to uh, their members uh, rather than sort of the, the, the wider um, commercial uh, public? Some of them are grand premises and some of them aren't. And the clue is really that they are private members clubs. Um, from our point of view, and we've had, apart from the wedding thing, there have been a series of events that have been staged in them which are not really for their members. Um, there have been you know, a series of different type of events that we would generally stage, not just hotels, but other commercial premises would go to those particular things. From our point of view, it is really the cost-based question. We pay rates, we pay that, we pay all those other things, and we make a contribution to the economy. We're in a different cost base. Private members clubs were designed for the use of private members, and sometimes people will have a wedding or a particular function there, and that's fine. But we've had occasion when um, a particular demonstration, a cookery demonstration or things like that have taken place in them, Again, that mightn't be something that the hotel would wish to do, but it has been staged there and open to the public um, with a ticketed price and therefore becomes an income stream. And I can understand that people um, have to break even and that they want to do that, but they then directly compete for events that we have. They may convent, um, compete for smaller events that may not seem all that important, but training has been done on them. Um, events that take place in the local community all of a sudden have moved into them. And those, in general, are not really members' events. They've been advertised, um, and anybody can go along to them. And that's the concern that we have, is that once these events are open to the public, it would be very difficult to place them. And place, you know, you have to join for membership to attend, you know, a dance or whatever it is. But it's very easy to get around that membership. It could be a members' dance but you may be able to afford membership for a very small fee. And it's that public thing that all of a sudden you open up a new venue in an area which isn't completing on the same cost base as the rest of us. And it's really that cost base question is a busy piece for us more than the actual event itself. Um, if everybody was paying rates and all those other costs that we had in the same costs um, in relation to staff, then it would be a fair playing field. It's a very different matter if you're going to something that's run by volunteers, doesn't happen to open 365 days a year and doesn't have to pay commercial rates. Okay, can, can, just, uh, can you identify any areas where you see private members' clubs operating in a much more commercial environment by a, 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 a policy that they're, they're putting forward? Or is it really an ad hoc reaction to, to opportunities? The policy document would be that they would pay they would pay public liability insurance like the rest of us. They would pay VAT like the rest of us, and they would also pay rates. And if that's the route that they want to go down, some clubs I hasten to do operate in that manner. Some of the more commercial ones, and that's fine. Um, but it's if they are wanting to do something that is a of a public nature, providing facilities that the public can use, then it would be only fair that they are based on the same cost base as the rest of us, as well as the same licensing rules in terms of public liability and stuff like that. And that's an important thing from the point of view of how we actually compete for different businesses, particularly in rural areas, actually. It's an important thing. Everybody wants to have a hotel in their local area, and that's nice to have. But some events that take place, you know, summer barbecues in the local golf club might sound lovely, but in reality, the public are going to those. And that's an opportunity that we have obviously missed against a background. If the club is paying VAT and they're paying rates and they're paying all those other things, that's fine. But some of them are not. Because of the way they're set up, they're not. They're not actually doing anything that's illegal. But if we are going to if they are going to compete on a public on the public playing field, then that would need to be addressed. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Robin. Uh, Mark. Thank 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Janice, for the presentation. I did not buy through well, so someone may have raised this, and if they did, apologies, and you can feel free to cut me off, Chair. But, Janice, in the presentation there, uh, you'd expressed a wee bit of concern around the designation and criteria of a major event. Are there any specific features that, that you would like to see or not see in that definition? Uh, I did answer the question a little bit, but your question slightly more specific, uh, Mark. Um, I think there are so many events, and I think my definition of a major event and your definition could be quite different. Um, you know, if I take if I take Derry is doing a new event on the um, on the walls, a new festival event on the walls, where you maybe invite, you know, 50, 60 people from other 50, 60 delegations from other walled cities around the world. Um, never been held before, no track record of it. Um, how do you define if that's major or not? And that would be the bit that would concern us. It's, you know, is a major, if I say it's a major, a major event in some cities might be a million pounds and it might be a global event, a major event in other locations may not be. And that's the bit I think we need to be quite careful on. And it's also the process that people will have to go through when the major event can be decided, can you get either a code drawn up that something automatically or falls into that criterion and you can bid accordingly? But there would be nothing worse than you bidding for an event, assuming that it had a major event designation and then suddenly finding out that it didn't. And then you would find yourself back to square one again. I mean, another good example would be the BBC Good Food Show. If it decided maybe to come to Guildhall Square, it could be decided, oh, well, that's not a it's a commercial event. It's not a major event. Um, and a lot of the stalls in that would not be able to execute their actual business if it couldn't get that particular status. I think many sporting events, um, yeah. for example, the, 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 Royal, the uh, Open at Portrush was a very good example. They have a major whiskey sponsor um, and they wanted to be able to sell a, a product that is in a, sort of a, uh, a souvenir is the wrong word, but it sort of like it marks the occasion. Um, and it wasn't for consumption on site. It was to bring home. And it, it, it's that it's the actual process as well as the designation that worries us and how long it takes. You know, if this goes in somewhere and it takes, you sometimes have a very short bidding window for things. So, you know, if there, and any barrier that an organiser sees can put them off. I mean, we would be very keen to see events of a global nature coming here, and I think that's very important. We had the MTV Awards a number of years ago, particularly in the current climate. It would be nice to see us to be able to go back to get large events, and they do really help put um, Northern Ireland on the map globally. Um, we did a fantastic job at the Open, and that they really want to come back. And if we are going to have maybe other golfing events, they may have a similar structure where whiskey or a gin or whoever is supplier. And I think those are things, for example, I would never have thought along the lines of them having somebody who's doing a souvenir product for the event. And I think it's the nuances of that would worry me and how you actually, how you can speed up that process. I mean, can you decide that it's a major event in 10 days? Is it 10 days, 10 weeks or 10 months? And I suppose it's that bit of it that really concerns us um, as much as anything else. And also, if somebody creates a new event, how will that be viewed? Yeah, it's, it's, you touched on the sporting event and the Open. Like, no one could dispute that that's a major event. But if, for example, Derry City or Glen Torren or someone was playing in a, a semi-final some Friday evening, could that be judged to be major? You know, it might be major in an area, mm -hmm. but 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 not in the greater scheme of things. You know, that's the area that it's major, and that where the applications would be coming from, and those who would benefit from it. But then, could that be abused by people, maybe geographically further removed <laughs> from that area, who just put in applications for the same thing and say, "Well, if they're applying for that and getting it, so will we." It is also, these are commercial events and that's the one thing you need, you know, commercial people tend to want decisions very quickly. A really good example would be a competition. Say, for example, Derry City, and now I'm going into a fantasy world. We're in the finals of the Champions League. That really is a fantasy world. That is a fantasy world. The Brandywell would be suddenly elevated. It would be, um, and you're also playing Real Madrid, um, which really does take you to a new world. 
So if you're if you're doing that, you played know, them before. Exactly. Played, played, played at the brand they will before. Indeed, indeed, I think I may have been there, which proves it was a long time ago. Um, but you know, if you if you did that, for example, would that be a you know would that be a you know a big a big thing that you sort of suddenly was and you maybe had two weeks out, you had to decide was it a you know a major event? A, another good example would be say James McLean decides that he wants to play a series of uh, testimonial matches. Are they major events or are they not? Now you may not, you may or may not want alcohol provision around them. You know, you may have a sponsor who wants to do certain things. That might be feeding people later on in the evening. It might be looking at some different type of sponsorship. And those are the questions. When you get into the commercial side of this, it can become quite a minefield. Okay. Uh, thank you, Janice. And sorry, Chair, I should have declared an interest in this session as well. Thank you. No problem, Mark. Look, thank you. Um, I have, Janice, I have no other members who are wanting to ask anything further. So can I thank you um, for your submission and for, for briefing the committee today? Thank you. Very nice to talk to you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, members, um, we still have an hour left of committee, so we should get through all of our business that we originally intended doing. So what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to just continue on the agenda from 9 to 15, and then I'm going to go back to matters arising. And um, if someone could just remind me where we are whenever we get to that, that would be good. So I'm going to move then on to agenda item 9, which is SL1, the, the Local Government Capital and Accounting Coronavirus Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find this at page 141 of your meeting pack. Um, the proposed rule will be a technical amendment to the local government regulations, which will extend the deadline um, to set their budget for 21-22. Members, I have a wee bit of a difficulty with this. On reading this, it's allowing the local councils an extra two weeks um, to set their budget. And I know when Solace were in and briefed us last, they had uh, certainly had asked that uh, are requested uh, and one of their asks that the, the district budget and the regional budget be set in and around the same time. So if members would be, agree with me, I would like to ask um, the department to come in next week just to give us a, a brief on this, um, because I want to know, is this in line with what Solace had asked for? Or uh, I really don't see that two weeks extension for councils to set their budget, but budget is going to do them any great favours in any way, shape or form. Um, so would members be in agreement with that, that we ask the department to, to give us a bit more detail on this next week? Agreed. Yeah, agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, then, um, I'm going to move on then to agenda item 10, SR 2020-347, Social Security Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Citizens' Rights Agreement Revocation Order NI 2020. Members will find this SR at 149. This rule is not subject to any resolution procedures. Are member, members content to note? Content to note. Good stuff, thank you. Then agenda uh, uh, item 11, SR 2020 348, Social Security Switzerland, Citizens' Rights um, Agreement Revocation Order NI 2020. Members should find a copy of this SR 153. This rule is also not subject to any resolution procedure, so are members content to note this also? Content. Thank you. Agenda item 12, SR 2020 the Statutory Sick Pay General Coronavirus Amendment Number 7, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Members should find a copy of this SR at page 157. Um, members, have you any objection to the rule? No? Okay, no objection to rule. So I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020 351. The Statutory Sick Pay Direct General Coronavirus Amendment No. 7 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Move on then to Agenda Item 13, which is SR 2020-357, the Social Security Norway Order Northern Ireland 2020. Members, a copy of this SR is at page 167 and this rule is not subject to any resolution procedures. So can I ask members, are you content to note? <clears throat> no. Ten, thank you. Yeah. Then we'll move on to agenda item 14, which is SR 2021 forward slash one, the COVID-19 heating payment scheme regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this statutory rule at 182. 
and uh, see Andy has his hand up. <laughs> so Andy, come on in. Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. I just want to ask, Dan, given um, our viewpoint earlier on today, and we're going to write to the department, is there any possibility of us deferring? And I'm, I'm not saying I'm opposed to this, and, and if it was to prevent the department, I still put place on record quite firmly uh, my concern that I believe it's poorly drafted overall uh, in respect of that, but would there be the option of us deferring this till next week? meeting uh, in order to give the department the opportunity to rectify the clear omission. Okay, I know that it comes into effect on the 25th of January. Um, Janice, can you give us any, can we, um, um, what can we do with this? Well, I think, yes, on the, the note I'd hand to you, yes, we can. This is, this is really the committee's this last, is our last chance. chance. To, um, it, unless you want to pray against it at some point, but yeah, we can. I think um, wait to get another briefing from the department if that for yeah. one more week if that's suitable. Okay, so it is uh, doable. Sir, just, yeah. just if I can, you know, and I would stress yeah. this isn't about me trying to stop the two hundred twenty-one thousand people getting it, and and you know it, it's well intentioned, and and you know, I would like to have seen it going for, uh, further than that. You know there are a lot more people who would have benefited from this, and you know questions around £200, you know, I'm not getting into all that, but there clearly is the opportunity for the department, and I think it would be much simpler for the department to do it through the SSR, because my understanding would be 10-minute uh, drafting to, to change this would enable the department to do it, rather than bringing a whole new piece of legislation or our statutory rule through. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, it, but going on the dates, if it comes into effect the 25th next week, it will allow us one more week, so yeah, that should be okay. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. Members agreed? I just, uh, agreed. Sorry, Sorry, Robin, go ahead. Sorry, no, Robin, and then, and then Sinead. No, supportive of what Andy has said, Chairman, but maybe just within that also, in Clause 4.1, um, these are emergency regulations, so I, I think uh, I know the answer to the question already, but um, the Department has not taken undertaken a public consultation, and I would understand that, Chair. But even though know, it may not be the normal public consultation, is it not appropriate that some form of consultation, even if it be from specialist bodies, is, is uh, taken? And maybe the department would answer Chair, that. can I... Chair. I think with the emergency... With I, I, I this, think I understand have, it, We've Chair. had emergency legislation yeah, for yeah, almost yeah. a year now, and we do yeah. understand that, that, yeah. that there are shortcuts are taken there, yeah. but that, it's a good point. Kelly, you wanted to come in? Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Chair, I and, and Sinead wanted to come in first. Sorry, Kelly, Sinead. Chair, my connection, I think it's my connection is so bad. I, I heard absolutely none of that whatsoever. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. We can hear you, OK? Are you OK? It's the room, it's the room. It's the room. Yeah. I was just about, that was why my point as well, Chair, was just that the, the room, when Andy started to speak there, the microphones went down and Robin, it was it was static there. Um, it's it, We're all remote are, are getting this. Um, it's something to do with Starleaf. OK, well, can you hear me OK at the minute? Yeah. Okay. I've been great up to this point. Okay. All right. What Andy has proposed, and there we do, we are within our time limit, is that we ask the committee to, or the, sorry, the department to come in next week again around this item agenda number fourteen, the COVID heating scheme. It is due to go live on or come into effect on the twenty fifth of January. So we have one more week as a committee, and um, so that was just to get agreement on that um, first and foremost. Agreed. Okay. I'd, I'd certainly be supportive of, of, of what Andy's saying in terms of improving uh, the scheme, but we have to be assured, I suppose, that it's not going to lead to delay in the rollout uh, of the scheme. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of calls already this morning. Uh, people who haven't got their winter fuel payment yet. You know, they started paying that out the week before Christmas and there's still pensioners out there uh, waiting on it. Some people have expressed concern that this heating payment, the COVID heating payment was coming late on in January, maybe. When, well, hopefully when the coldest weather is o o over us. So you don't want to delay it further, given that it is going to probably take a few weeks to roll out. So not everyone's going to get it on, on the 25th, even if we do manage to get it out on the 25th. There'll be people maybe three or four weeks later still waiting on it, freezing. Yeah, well, I mean, it would, the, the, the 
time scale of it was always going to be the end of January and we are still within our time scale and if the department had have maybe come back with a little bit more of uh, you know optimism around Andy's proposal we wouldn't be in this position so I, I think we do we do still have that one more week um, um, as, as far as I'm aware uh, and sure. it, that shouldn't hold up that shouldn't hold up this payment at all sorry was that Sinead was that you Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Listen, you know, I agree with what uh, Mark's saying there. You know, we don't, we need to be assured that there's no delays to this year. And, you know, while Andy's proposal may have merit, I think we should allow the Minister the opportunity to respond. We, we agreed at the start of the meeting that we would, we would ask them to respond. Um, and I don't think it's, it's fair to say that, you know, there was no optimism, that there's clear criteria for the scheme. Uh, and that, that criteria has been fulfilled. Um, so if other uh, sections weren't in, within that criteria, then you know, let the Minister come and explain why that can or can't happen. Okay, well then that's fair enough. We'll let then the Department or the Minister come and explain next week then that whether that can or why this can't happen, and then we'll, we'll, we'll then complete the SR at next week's meeting. That's fair enough. Yeah? Post Chair, just, just in, in return to that, you Sorry, go ahead, Sinead, sorry. Sorry, that wasn't my proposal. Oh, okay. What was your proposal, that we go ahead and just retrospectively get the information? My proposal was that we allow the Minister res to respond. Um, so whether, you know, we agreed at the start of the meeting, we would give the, give, give them the opportunity to come back to us. Oh. Um, I, didn't, I didn't state that was in person. If that's in writing. Well, that's okay. If it's in writing, that's fair enough. I'm sure um, I'm happy with that as well, um, whatever the response is. But we're asking even if the department can come in. No, it doesn't I know there will be issues with the minister coming in and it's such short notice, and I get that. Absolutely. I don't expect her to be here next week to answer questions. Absolutely not. Um, but I do think the department have a role there. Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, sure. All, all I'm saying here, and, and, and 100%, fully in support of what Mark's saying, you know, I would by no means want to see a delay to this scheme. And um, from all of the information I've looked at, you're, it's correct, end of January, we're within the, the time frame of the rule. All I'm saying here is, well, yes, we are allowing the department time to come back, but let's say the department do accept the, the point that we're putting across. It's a much more uh, practical way for them to amend it or to, to change it by doing it through this SR, if that is practical. So if we defer our, our consideration of it till next week without impacting on the SR itself, I think it's it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to make comment? No, just uh, if we can do that, absolutely. I'd support that or second it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we are within our time frame, so we are. We will write to the minister and to the department, and absolutely, the the case is there that it would be much easier if the amendment was made to this statutory rule rather than having to go back after that and uh, write an, a new piece of, of legislation. Um, it certainly would be, would be much easier and much quicker for that the, the flow of money going out um, to, to the, the, the other people that need to be included in this. So our members agreed then uh, that, OK, we're going to write to the Minister, and that's fair enough. We will do that for a written response. Um, our members agreed then that we leave this until next week. We might have some sort of response back. There might be some agreement has been made. Um, and the minister may well then have made that amendment or asked for the department to make that amendment and we will know that then next week and that still gives us time for this to stay within its time frame and on track for the 25th of January. Is that okay? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Good. Good stuff. Right, we'll move then on to agenda item 15, which is SR 2021 forward slash 2, the Universal Credit Transitional Provisions claimant, pre Claimants Previously Entitled to a Severe Disability Premium Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Members, a copy of this statutory rule is at page 192 of your meeting pack. Can I then ask, have members any objections to the rule? No. No objections. Okay, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021 forward slash 2, the Universal Credit Transitional Provisions Claimants Previously Entitled to a Severe Disability Premium Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we're going to then move back to our matters arising. 
Okay, can someone then just prompt me in the room here? Are we then going to page 48? Would that be right? Is that where we're up to, or did we do 48? Give me a second. Give I'll give you a minute. <laughs> yeah, because I'm completely yeah, lost. Yeah. Yay, yeah. good stuff. There we are. Thought it was right. Okay. Members then, okay, we'll then move then to page 48, and there's a departmental reply to the committee queries on the second independent review of the PIP report. Any comments, or are you content to note? Kelly, go ahead. Sorry, um, yeah, I think that we obviously have recommendations that are coming forward from um, Ray Kavanaugh, which are very welcomed. We'll, we will hear, as the department says, that they're considering that at the moment. My concern would be that we're we're not running in parallel with the welfare reform, the, with, with the mitigations and this PIP review. Um, so I'm just concerned that... I, I, maybe the question is, could we write back to the department to ask them, will they be taking the considerations from Marie into consideration when they're looking at the at the mitigations? Because if there's something falling out of that, uh, we don't want to exclude it from the mitigations because the mitigations are going to be in place for potentially a year or three years or whatever. Um, if there's something coming out that Marie has that, that reflects it's not contained within PIP or it could be an improvement, is something that we're looking at. I'm just wondering if, if we could just check to make sure that the department is considering that alongside the mitigations. Okay, well done. That's a good, good comment. We'll go ahead with that. Okay, members, happy to move on to our next item. Um, you've been provided at page 50 with a departmental reply to committee queries on liquor licensing and COVID-19 funding for sports clubs. Uh, members, again, this this I, I heard it actually. I was listening to the economy committee. I think it was yesterday, and it was brought up again on the economy committee also, or finance committee. Maybe it was. Can't remember. It was one or the other. Um, and I know I have been contacted by Lisburn Cricket Club. I've also been contacted by a football club in in the the Mid Ulster area. There seems to be um, a, a confusion around this again, where we have these clubs that have bars in them, and I know that will be the same. There are many there are many GAA clubs as well with bars in them. And the whole way through COVID, these bars were treated as businesses and were given business grants. They have staff on furlough, they have overheads, they have bills, and they're still coming in. But whenever they have applied for the latest round of funding through the department, must be in the Department of Finance, actually, committee I was watching, the Department of Finance, they've been told that, no, they have to apply through the Department of Communities, through the, 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 the sporting grant. Um, so, again, I had asked the question of the Minister in the Chamber, I think way back end of November around this. Um, I've brought it up in this committee, and it's just that we have many, many of our clubs have bars within them, and they are going to be treated differently to the likes of a working man's club or a, a social club. Um, who will be receiving are receiving funding from from the Department of Finance? Um, so I just want to get this sorted once and for all because there's many sporting clubs out there that don't know how they're going to be paying their staff furlough and everything else now. Um, so uh, it's just it's very unclear. So our members in agreement that we write to the department again on this. Um, they ask for further clarification as to what the conversations they're having with the finance minister, as what the ministers have with the finance minister and their department, um, because I think all of these sporting clubs need some sort of clear direction as to what they, what, where their money is coming from um, to cover their overheads and their bills. Members agree with that? I don't know if, they, if any members have been contacted as well. Andy? Yeah, sure. I've had the same issue um, whereby... Uh, a number of the clubs who have contacted me would in indicate that they are aware of others who received it previously uh, and there is a bit of an anomaly here so I would, go, I would ask that we go further and write to the Minister of Finance and ask him to, to level the playing field here in respect to those, those bars. I have already written to him in the capacity as an MLA in, in, in that respect highlighting the anomaly from the perspective of the constituents who have contacted me. By all intents and purposes, they were considered under uh, businesses as bars, etc. Previously, and it seems now, due to the sports sustainability fund, they're being directed towards that. What they're saying, what all these clubs are saying to me, is we're not looking to get you know two payments. We're just looking uh, for support under the appropriate scheme. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. Any other members want to Kelly? Um, it's on another part of this letter, Chair, if you don't That's mind. Okay. It's about the license. Okay. It's about that, um, the licensing and registration of clubs where we had asked for um, a list of the liquor license holders. 
Disappointed. Um, I, I'm not criticising the department. We are with a situation at the moment where the information is held within district courts. And while there's been some numbers provided to us, I'm very concerned that we're creating legislation where the department who may have the control over any future um uh, we talked about it earlier, sorry, um, codes of conduct and so on. We don't actually have the details of those license holders. So I'm not sure whether this is, it's not for the department now because they're doing exactly what they need to do within the current system. But surely in the future, there should be somewhere held a list of all of the license holders so that we can, as a, a government, um, be able to consider, you know, where are those license based are, are there equitable, you know, provision of those licenses across Northern Ireland? You know, is there any Section 75 or equality impact assessments that need to be carried out on, on this? I think that there's more information there as a scrutiny committee that, that we might consider going forward. And I don't think it is anything because the, the department is doing what they they do within the current arrangements. But I just think for moving forward, it may well be something that we might need to consider or I don't know how others feel about it. But um, I think that there should be a centrally held list by government and communities is the place to hold that, um, given the fact that we cannot get a list of, of who all the license holders are unless we personally go around each district court and ask them for the information. With open government and transparency, I just think that, that moving forward, we move away from this system where it's it's quite complicated to something where it's, it's made much more streamlined and easy to access the information. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Any other members, any comments on that? No? Okay. Well, I think, Kelly, that's something that we maybe need to look a bit further into. I don't know whether there's any um, data protection around any of that or anything else. I don't know. Um, I think that is something certainly we could we could look into as a committee. Um, um, but we'll, we'll uh, be led by the committee clerks on that. Yeah? Okay? okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Members, then, if we could move on then to page 52, we have a departmental reply to committee queries on the labour market intervention. Um, the reply notes that the job start scheme had been due to launch, as we know, on the 14th of December 2020, but unfortunately the launch has been paused while some last minute, minute issues are addressed. A number of other labour market recovery interventions are also paused and a further update when more information will become available. Um, again, this is something that was in committee um, uh, before we broke for recess and we all of the members had voiced their disappointment that this has not been started. We haven't been given any actually real reasons as to why it has been paused in any great detail. Um, so I just, I'll just open it up for comment. I know, Andy, you brought yeah, it I just wanted to reinforce the point and just go back to the department and ask what nurse is going on. Um, I think it's just uh, not good enough to give us a holding statement, considering a um, similar scheme in the UK uh, is live, operational. I know there are probably nuances around the current restrictions, but um, I don't see why the further delays. Yeah, I didn't think it was a, a, a great response either. I uh, have Kelly and then have Mark. Kelly? Um, I would like to ask clarification. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that the department didn't wasn't successful um, in an application for funds specifically for these schemes. Um, and I'm just wondering, was there any money that was set aside within the department's budget that is now having to be returned because this scheme cannot be rolled out in time? We're only a matter of weeks away from the end of the financial year. And I'm just wondering given the fact that we're so close to the financial year, is there the potential for this uh, money to be lost that was intended um, for the schemes? And, um, you know, has the, even if we could find out from the department, is there the intention to hold fire until the new financial year? I know, and I stand corrected if, I, if I'm wrong here, um, the job start scheme was certainly wasn't that money that was coming via Westminster. Um, so it was, it was a part of consequence. Part of consequence. Yeah, but I think... Yeah. When the, yeah, but it didn't. It wasn't ring fenced for that purpose when it got here. I thought that the minister had sadly, unfortunately, wasn't successful in her bid and was going to meet this money through internal um, savings that had been made, I believe. But this, this is the sort of information we could ask for clarification. Yeah, that, absolutely. No, definitely, Kelly will ask for clarification on that. Mark, you wanted to come in. Uh, actually, it wasn't the way I had indicated to come in on this one. Yeah, but now I was wondering just. Uh, could, could there be an issue, do you know, in terms of the delays? Is staffing anything to do with that, possibly? 
Well, as I mean, you, you you see the response. We absolutely don't know what the delays are. We haven't been given any information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you could be right. I think we do need to write back as a committee, um, raise the issues that Kelly has raised, and certainly raise the issues that Andy has raised as well. Um, we actually we deserve more detail than what we've been given. I think it's been pretty. I I, I don't like this response at all. I think we deserve a bit more respect yeah. in the in, in the detail. Uh, and ask about the staff as well. Okay, Mark, <laughs> well done. All right. Okay, members, happy enough then that we move on then to our next one. Okay, and I have to just put a warning out here that I might say this wrong and we'll blame Oliver if I say it wrong. So, members, you've been provided at page 54 with a reply from Kistia uh, to the committee queries on the COVID-19 Culture, Languages, Arts and Heritage Programme. Um, following the meeting on the 3rd of December 2020, we wrote to language groups that processed applications to ask how the process went, um, were they oversubscribed, how many were brand new applications, and to provide a breakdown, which um, this group certainly has to us. So it's just to ask member of you any comments, are you content to note? Content to note. Content to note, and can I thank them for um, responding to the committee as well? Um, then we'll... Your pronunciation was to add on chair as well. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That's good to know. <laughs> so it was, and thank you, Oliver. Um, okay, then we'll move on to um, the next part, which is page 55 of your briefing paper, and that is uh, uh, from Advice ANI on safeguarding vulnerable Social Security benefits claimants. The paper explores the challenges facing our vulnerable claimants and the current support provisions by from DFC and DWP. Um, they highlight that it is clear that the current system is designed for the majority of, of simple cases, whereas it is more complex cases of vulnerable claimants that the system needs to pro uh, proactively support. They note that safeguarding measures for vulnerable claimants are not as yet set in legislation in GB or in Northern Ireland, but would argue that there should be a moral responsibility to ensure that vulnerable claimants are not disadvantaged. Um, advice and I asked um, in 2019 if universal credit is a business area within DFC has its own safeguarding champion. DFC replied that there was no such rule. However, Advice and I advised that DWP intend to have up to 25 senior safeguarding leaders in place by autumn 2020. Um, advice and I are, are keen to continue to. Uh, the work of the new Adult Safeguarding Transformation Board in Northern Ireland in connection with the proposed Adult Safeguarding Bill for Northern Ireland and feel like the bill must be as broad scope to protect vulnerable social security claimants. Um, I, I mentioned it in our last our, our meeting previously um, that I had felt also that whenever the, the Department of Health do launch the Adult Safeguarding Bill, I think there is a rule for this committee. Um, in, its, in its response to that as well. So it's just to, 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 to put that back on record again. Um, members, any comments? Or are they content to note that? Kelly? Can I, can I, sorry, Chair. I was just actually going to say, I'm sure Advice and I have provided this to um, the department, but if we could maybe pass on their, their information to the department to ask that when the welfare mitigations package is being considered, that some of this information is considered there. Um, because we haven't seen what's within the, the the thoughts of the Department on Welfare Mitigations, it would be useful to, to highlight this to them. And you're absolutely right when it comes to the vulnerable adults. As we all know, the telephone um, system that has gone through hasn't been the best for people with learned disabilities or people with mental health issues. Um, it, I, I personally haven't found that as helpful and the amount of appeals going through, I believe, has increased Um it hasn't been great. I don't think the vulnerability of some of our um, applicants have been has been considered appropriately. And it would be it's not so much for the welfare mitigations shouldn't just be about money. Um, it should be about better ways of working to protect people. Um, and I think that that advice and I have brought forward a very clear number of comments that should be taken into consideration by the department when they're they're considering the welfare mitigations going forward. I think you're absolutely right, Kelly, and I think we need to ask them what they're actually doing about this because we do know that um, DWP um, had said they wanted 25 in place by autumn 2020, and I know the, the clerk has, has put a note here for me to say that by May 2020, DUP had 10 in place in response to the pandemic, 
alone, and yet we uh, the answer that was given from um, from the, the uh, Department for Communities was just a simple no to um, to advice NI. So I think we need to uh, champion that also by asking as a committee of the of the, of the department um, why this is why there has been nothing put in place to date, and what is their plan and what is their time scale um, to get um, the safeguarding champions in. Members agree? Yeah, agreed. All right, okay. Right, that's all of that finished, and then we're going to go whiz back in ourselves again. And I think then we're going to agenda item 16, which is correspondence. Uh, members, you'll find correspondence memo at page 202 of your meeting pack. I uh, would like to draw the attention to correspondence in relation to the Caravans Act 2011, and that's at page 207. Mm -hmm. um, some time ago, I sought clarity on the area on this area from the department and was advised that responsibility for the legislation is shared between the Department for Communities and the Department of the Economy. DFC's primary purpose in this legislation is in relation to Part 1 of the Caravans Act 2011 for those people who live on a caravan park or site as their permanent residence. Uh, however, Part 2 of the Act is the responsibility of, for the Department of the Economy and contains specific legislation controlling the arrangements between park owners and those renting caravan pitches for more than 28 days. Um, uh, just members, are you content to forward the correspondence to the department to address the queries that relate to their responsibility under the, the Act? Uh, I know that during the summer time or uh, near or autumn time, our constituency offices would have got various letters from caravan owners, and um, there was there was a bit of confusion as to whose role and responsibility it is. Um, so, are members happy that um, we ask the department uh, just under their responsibility? Yep, agreed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Alex, did you want to say something on this? Sort of. Um, <laughs> okay. There's a review of the Caravan Act coming this year, just to let you know. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. Well, it yeah. does, probably does need to review, review the Caravan Act. I think that was, wasn't it John um, brought that in yeah. way back when? Yeah. Okay. Certainly Members, I have class. not. Sorry, Declaring go ahead. As a caravan owner, I don't live in the caravan, but I was <laughs> Okay, Andy. Okay, members, I have nothing else I want to bring up under correspondence. Can I ask, is there any members want to bring anything up under correspondence? No, we're happy enough to, to note the correspondence memo? Yeah? Yeah. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, agenda item 17 is our forward work programme. Members um, at the meeting on the 21st of January 2021, we will be briefed by the following organisations on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill that is Le Lakata Brewery Cooperative, the Society of Independent Brewers, the Champ, Champ, uh, Champ Campaign for Real Ale Northern Ireland, and Unite the Union. Um, members content to note that? Sweet. Yeah. Content. Okay, thank you. Agenda item 18 then is any other business? Can I ask members have anybody any other business they want to highlight at this time? No, nobody? Oh, sorry, Mark, go ahead, Mark. Uh, just one wee thing, Chair, uh, and I had notified you, I think, that, that I might uh, raise in front of you that know me, and I think all of you should know me well enough to know that I'm not pukey particularly or, or precious about about position. But it's just that over the past couple of months, uh, there have been times, or every time I've written to the Minister on an issue, you know, and we're talking here about political matters where I'd be asking for the minister to give consideration to scrapping PIP award reviews during the pandemic. Or my most recent one was about a, a payment, a support payment to people who are sh shielding. But I keep getting letters back from the private office saying, saying oh, this is an operational issue. Uh, we'll get X, Y or Z to answer instead. Now, on each occasion, I've gone back and says, no, I prefer to get a response from the minister because it's it's a political question. It's not an operational one. But it was just to make the point, and I don't know how other members on the committee would view this or have we a role as the committee to, 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 to write to, to the minister and reinforce the fact that when an MLA writes to a minister, particularly I think maybe a, a committee member, on an issue that it warrants a ministerial uh, response, like I said, I don't want to come across as pukey about that. And I do recognise that within this department, there's been a transition, a double transition almost. Minister Hargey's just come back, and I don't know if that's anything to do with it. But 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 I do think when MLAs are, are 
We, we don't write to the minister well in Okay, I, I know from a, a thanks, Mark, for that. I know from a personal perspective, I don't have a difficulty because I have a I have a direct link to to the ministers, so I have never had any sort of problem. I'll ask other members if they have experienced anything. I don't know. Um, or understand where Mark's coming from? No? I, I, I wouldn't say so much, uh, similar issue. There has been times where I've wrote and it's taken quite a while, understandable, the COVID pandemic. And sometimes some of the questions I posed via the private office needed an operational answer, but there are other questions that needed a ministerial answer. So <clears throat> I'd be supportive of what Mark's saying. You know, there will be occasions whereby it's not, it's not maybe practical for it to be passed off from a policy perspective just to... Uh, Official. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so sometimes it, you know they're practical, or p people consider what's practical, and other times it might be what's palatable. Uh, but 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 it, it, I do think we should be afforded the respect of, of a response. Okay. Okay. But that's as an individual member, isn't it, Mark? You're you're coming from here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has any comment they want to, to make on this. Um. I know. I I say I I certainly haven't had an issue, so I haven't. Um, but then I'm in a very different position where I have got the, I, I can contact the minister when I, when I need to. Um, members, is, Mark has, has asked that we write as a committee about this. What do members feel about that? It's up to the committee. I'm happy enough to support him. Okay. Uh, Chair, I'd be happy with that. Um, it's not necessarily for our minister, um, but there has been a lot of um, concerns raised by others um, about, I suppose, the content that comes back with written questions and responses back to MLAs. Um, I know we could be seen as a bit of a pain in the neck at times, but I do believe that whenever MLAs are writing directly to a minister, um, it is it is that political piece um, that's outside of usually operational stuff. I haven't had an issue per se, but it does no harm Um I think as a committee, just for us to encourage any minister, I suppose, but our minister that is, is the main one that we're concerned with here um, is just that, you know, when we write directly to a minister and not use the, the written assembly questions, um, there's a reason for that. Yeah, it is very different to go through a private office, I would agree with you. And you do expect um, a, a different, you do, you do expect a different type of response. So you do. Um, okay, I mean, I'm very much led by members of what they want to do. So if, if no one, if everybody seems to be of, of some sort of agreement there. And, though I, and I actually don't think it's just it's just our minister. I think no, it, I think there there's issues across the board. Um, so there are, um, but um, that's maybe something that the I don't know the business committee might want to take up as well at some stage when looking at that, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, we can we can write as a committee. That's fine. All right, members. Was there any other business anybody wanted to bring up? No. Happy enough where we are. All right. Agenda item nineteen is date, time, and location of our next meeting. Can I advise you that our next meeting will take place um, next Thursday, the twenty first of January, twenty twenty one, at nine fifteen, here in room twenty nine. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.